Okay, I'm going to call call to order the um, February 9th, 2023 uh, meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town in Nantucket. Um, would someone approve the agenda as drafted? Thank you. Second. Okay, Michael makes a motion. Elisa seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. aye. Approval of the minutes from January 12th, 2022. Uh, I read over the minutes. I did not have any, uh, any corrections or. And two. Oh, the only thing I thought um, in the headings for the minutes, um, it says that Jeff Thayer was absent and it doesn't include an attending members or yeah, attending members, John Brescher, but he's um, sat on, I think, is, I think at that point, is Jeff already off the board at that point? And John is on, he's sitting on applications. So maybe if even if even if Jeff there doesn't come off, pressure needs to be added. That was it for me. Continue that, or just I think did, so. Jeff is not on the board anymore, right? He submitted his resignation, but I'm not sure when. So we can check and amend the minutes as necessary to reflect him okay. being a member or not, and adding John. Okay, so we can, if no one else has any um, uh, revisions or, or uh, corrections, we can approve pending that change. Um, so if someone would make a motion to approve the minutes with the clarification on Jeff there and the addition of John Brescher. So Lisa makes that motion. Second. John Brescher seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, can we just continue all the ones that need to be continued now? Yes, okay. and I don't know if this is updated on your agenda or not, but the Monomoy application, um, we received an email asking for continuance, so that's file number 2022. Okay. And the Vesper Lane application. Oh, that one also was continuing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which one was that? Uh, 0222 and 0223. Okay. 0223. Uh, page 420. Oh, 2022. Sorry, did I say yeah, the yeah. wrong thing? No, no, no. Uh, that was okay. Um, and the Vesper 11722. Sorry, wrong one out. Okay, 17. Okay, so the following applications are asking for, for continuance to the March 9th meeting. Um, application 09-22, application 10-22, application 20-22, and application 17-22. Um, would someone make a motion to allow those continuances to the March 9th, 2023 meeting? So moved. So Lisa makes the motion, would someone second? Second. Okay, so the uh, all those in favor of continuing those four applications to March, please say aye. 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 Okay, so those are continued. Uh, Madam Chair, could you all go ahead and take a vote on 1922 Picasso? Yeah. That's a request to withdraw without prejudice. Yep, I had that one next. So, um, so application 19-22 has asked to uh, withdraw without prejudice. This is 11A Meadow Lane, Picasso, Inc. Um, would someone make a motion to allow that can that uh, withdrawal without prejudice. I'll make that motion. And would someone second it? I'll second it. Okay, so Lisa makes a motion, Elisa seconds it. 
All those in favor of allowing 1922 to withdraw without prejudice, please say aye. 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 Okay, so that is withdrawn. Okay, so um, we can move on to old business, which the first application is 37-21, uh, uh, 8 Bank Street, Linda Williams presenting. It starts on page 14 of your packet. Uh, Madam Chair, yes. um, I'd just like to remind everyone that we do have to end the meeting by 3.30. Yes. So keep everything moving along. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Linda, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Linda Williams for the applicant. Um, we have, I believe we're down to method. Um, though it's questionable whether anybody has the right to tell them how to do something. We do have uh, a plan. We do have a lot more information now than we had the last time. And uh, our engineer, Wayne McArdle, is here. And our attorney, Michael Wilson, is also here. And I believe the owner is up on Zoom, though I can't quite tell. So I, owners are here. Oh, there they are. <laughs> so we're all here. And I expect the best way to do it is to turn it over to Wayne McArdle, the engineer, because that's really what we had drilled down to as an issue. Not the fact that it's slightly going up in a, about a two and a half square foot area of the house, the existing house. Uh, I will turn it over to Wayne. Hello, Wayne McCardle, McCardle Gann Associates. Um, I don't know if you remember last time we were here, I think it was back in November, um, we were asked to look at the existing rubble retaining wall on Middle Gully Road. We actually did that in, in January. We did dug a few test pits and I, we submitted that and I'm hoping that you have that with you, that package. Um, so anyway, at what we found was no surprise, uh, Middle Gully Road is a rubble, ro a rubble wall it's got no footing, no foundation, and is sitting basically at grade or just below grade. Um, but while we were doing that, we noticed we were looking closer at the, I don't know if you have uh, figure one from that package. Is it a site plan or a photo? It's a site plan. Site plan, yeah, then we. Big one, yes. Yes. Yep. So, um, page 18. Up until this point, we thought this uh, the, the, the concrete block uh, retaining wall ended at the northwestern corner of the existing building. And what we've discovered is it actually extends down the entire length of the building and returns at the southwestern corner. And there's a picture of that. It's, it's in black and white. It might be hard to tell, but. Which uh, number? I think it's picture five. The uh, concrete block retaining wall. Yep. Oh, I see. It's this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So this is apparently what is supporting everything behind it, including middle middle gully middle gully road. Um, and I know that since our last meeting, a, a lot of concerns have been raised by the neighbors, particularly about vibrations, vibration concerns from the installation of the shoring system. Um, even though it's a more expensive technique, we, I've spoken with the Amendolers and they've agreed that we would drill the soldier piles in. So vibrations won't be a concern. Um, the other thing that was mentioned too by the consultants was deflections of the shoring system. Again, I've talked to the Amendolers, even though it's more expensive, we're, we're going to uh, brace the top of the brace the top of the shoring system so that to uh, minimize or eliminate um, deflection of the system and any any type of settlement that might occur behind it. How is that going to be done? We just explain it in a little bit. Yeah, the top detail. of this. Well, we're working with geotechnical contractor at, the, at this point, trying to figure out you know exactly how that how we're going to brace the top of it mm -hmm. and how that's going to be done. So I don't have details or detailed plans at this point. The other thing that we're going to we're going to do is now that we know that this block concrete block retaining wall it is currently supporting Middle Valley Road and and everything behind it, um, we're going to incorporate that into the design. We're going to tie it back into the existing slope. With either helical piles or, or um, drilled in tiebacks. And that should uh, minimize or limit any type of settlement or any type of uh, issues that have been brought up. And those will be permanent? Permanent. Is there a plan that shows that? I don't. Again, we're going to have to work with a geotechnical contractor to come up with some ideas and designs. 
those would be available to the inspector when you went to get a permit though yes okay. oh yeah can you show us where I, I can't find which where's your plan that shows where the um helical piles are drilled in i don't there's no plan showing they would be drilled in, into the face of that existing concrete block retaining wall and they would go back into the slope i see so from the how do you how do you get in there if it's so close to the building well the house is going to be moved it's going to go straight up or get moved off site i believe yeah, it's, it's going to have to get moved off site yeah there's no choice i mean that's going to happen then what happens to the retaining walls around the window wells that are on that elevation the, which there's some window wells that show on the site plan that this wall now interrupts or they interrupt the wall that'll have to be we'll have to like I said, it's it's we'll have to work around those details. I think those are small details, but they can it can obviously that those have to be moved or, or adjusted. And I think I'm just looking at the site plan. I don't have the site plan with me. I, have an I don't think one. there's a, are there window wells on that on the yeah, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, there are. I mean, it's an old plan from yeah. my previous packet, this but nice. yeah, exactly. It shows up on the site plan. It, yeah. It's, well, it's 90, well, it's 25 no, showing the window wells. On the and new then, packet, it's 97. It's the site plan. And then, yeah, then 25 is the basement plan. Yeah, I thought we had window showing wells window on the wells. southern side of the building. I think that's, you might be looking at an older plan. No, yeah. we, what was submitted today was page 25 in the packet, and it shows, I mean, they're called plan. wells. Maybe they don't need to be well, maybe they're not below grade. I don't know. It says shallow window wells. Where are the elevations? We have to go back to the old elevations. So I don't know what shallow means, but they're not really that much. That's not the half the elevation. I think this is a break into a transom style. The windows, you see in most places, it's not a because. But they're still below the height of the retaining wall. Because the retaining wall presumably is mm -hmm. two or three feet above grade. Right. Anyway, that you guys have to work that out. It just yeah, well, I think might, that's you might not have windows. Right. We may have to the, work on that, that elevation. Um, but I think the you know that what that does is it it eliminates the vibrations, uh, reduces or eliminates deflections of the of the shoring system, and then the concerns about um, damage behind the system. I think it answer. I think it addresses all those concerns. At least most of the concerns that have been raised currently by the neighbors and the neighbors consultants. So the house will be picked up and moved. You'll put in these anchors back into the grade, and then you'll still have to drill down, drill down to get your pile system in for the new foundation. And, and, and right, and inst then install the uh, the lagging, pour the foundation using the shoring system as the outside. All that shoring, everything staying in place, and using the shoring system basically is basically is the outside form for the foundation. Mm -hmm. So will we see the tops of the um, metal sheets, steel sheets? No, everything will be cut off below grade when completed. Uh-huh, okay. Just looking over <clears throat> our list of concerns. If if this were to pass today, when would construction start? When would the shoring installation happen? Fall. Would be fall. So nothing's going to happen there until after the summer. Gotcha. We would usually put a timing yeah. restriction on the second. Yeah, I just didn't know if they were like yeah. ready to roll right now. Okay. Yep. Are we still concerned with the intrusion of the shed roof corner? It didn't. Well, I wasn't concerned about that. In in terms of that raising the foot that it raises. Mm -hmm which is the only part that needs relief. Mm -hmm. One person, but it didn't sound like a lot of people had concern with that. Mm -hmm. Does this explanation, um, does anyone have any concerns? We had concerns about how the bank would be supported in storms. 
does this explanation address that, Michael? I think that was I, one of your concerns. I'm, I'm uh, pretty confident that that will be addressed in the, the if, if there was any damage to the bank or that uh, rubble stone wall, um, I think the applicant already said that they would take care of that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've asked for a lot of information on this application. Uh, we got it, unfortunately, in drips and drabs, but in my opinion, they've done everything that we asked them to do. I do have one question, and maybe I just can't visualize it'd be helpful to have a section, but the retaining wall, do you know how deep the footing is on this concrete block retaining wall? Uh, we don't. And, and presumably, you know, if it's withstanding push from this side, it's got a footing that comes in this way to keep it from being pushed over. How does that all relate to where the new exterior wall of the building is going to be? The, the face of the wall, the existing retainer wall, is really all that we're concerned about because that's what we're going to be using to resist. Well, I'm just I'm just thinking conceptually how the building goes back down and goes deeper if there's a footing in its way. That would be cut off. If something came out that direction, I have no idea what, where the footing below that, where that block wall, we don't even know what it's what that's supported on at this point. Um, but I think- um, Just if, because the building's so close to that wall. Sure. I just want to make sure the footing- doesn't that's what I thought it was. What did you say? That you make the concrete wall or block wall part of the footing and for, for, the for a new wall, wall yeah, mm -hmm. as part of the house. Well, depending on how the, the tie backs will be put in, we may have to reinforce that face of the wall anyway. So there may be, like I said, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be permanent. So, for instance, the, the block wall, they may have to shoot shotcrete on to top on the surface of it to reinforce it for what we're doing. If I may, sure. Really care. All of this will be received at the engineering level before the building permits. Oh, sorry, Michael. I think the I think the um, NTV is saying they can't hear you. If you could go closer okay. to the microphone. All of this, I think, is going to be addressed through the engineers' plans, working in conjunction with the geotechnical firm, which will have to be reviewed and approved by the building commissioner and the building department's engineers. As far as questions regarding, uh, I understand. It's just more of an informational thing. It seems like something that's going to have to be dealt with. So I just was hoping you had thought about it. But I understand it's going to have to go for a, a design process and an engineering process. And you're not going to build something that's going to fall down. So. May I make a motion to approve? Well, at first, with yeah. Well, you can, but I think we're we're not quite there oh, yet. Yeah. Just because um, for the applicants, are is you are you guys I mean, I finished with your presentation at this? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. but available, I, I available for questions. Okay. questions. Right. But yes, the, the okay. presentation to address your last concerns. Will be there. Okay. Um, does anyone have any more questions for the applicant? Not at the moment. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this application? Okay. I'm going to Zoom next. Okay. So um, seeing that there's no one in the audience. Oh, uh, sorry, Sarah Aldro. Okay. So Nikki, could we bring up um, the attorney uh, on Zoom? I have several persons um, with their hands raised. What's the name? Okay. Malgorzata Rosek, you may go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 
Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mal Morozik. I'm an associate at Fitch Law Partners, um, and I'm here on behalf of Ann and Jeff Gardner, owners of Nine Bank, excuse me, of Nine Broadway and Nine Front Street, which abuts Eight Bank Street. Uh, the Gardners are also present today and would like to speak uh, after me. Um, we would request that the ZBA deny the special permit um, for this application. The ZBA should only issue special permits of structures and uses are in harmony with the general purposes of the zoning bylaws, which are to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of Nantucket's inhabitants. Um, in order to approve this special permit, the ZBA must make a finding that the proposed construction is not substantially more detrimental than the existing structure to the neighborhood, where there remain, despite opportunities for clarification and revision, serious concerns about still the stability of the retaining wall and middle gu gully, and the risk of damage to numerous surrounding properties, the proposed construction cannot be found to be not to not be substantially more detrimental than the existing structure. Uh, we therefore ask that the ZBA deny the special permit. Um, if I can just expand a little bit more, at the October hearing, uh, the board asked for uh, clarifications as to several concerns, um, including whether there is a plan to protect the Wall and Mill Gully Road, which we have still yet not seen specifically, uh, whether there were plans to contact neighbors and homeowners who wanted pre-construction surveys, plans to pay back homeowners who, whose properties may be damaged as a result um, of construction, clarification as to whether there is insurance to protect the abutters and whether the applicant has communicated with the town about the town's concerns regarding the stability of Middle Gully Road. So even with the letter submitted by McArdle in, on February 1st and, and some of the additional uh, plans they have expressed here, all of those concerns have not yet been taken care of. Um, the McArdle letter shows that this is you know, not a stable retaining wall that this has a, uh, is not supported by footing or foundation. It is fragile and therefore at risk um, with construction. Um, and the, the letter does not include any engineering conclusions or recommendations for protecting the wall or the surrounding properties. Um, and they have not submitted additional plans to account for the fragility or given it advance updates or designs uh, to support the excavation. As the plans do not specifically that have been submitted do not specifically address the numerous issues raised by both the board members and abutters at the last hearing in October. Um, we we request that the, the ZBA deny the special permit as this cannot be found to be not substantially um, more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, Mrs. Gardner is also present as is Mr. Gardner and I know they would also like to, to speak. So I'm not sure if you would like me to hand it over to them right now or if, or if others on Zoom should, should go first. Um, I think we'll hear from the gardeners and then go back to Zoom just for continuity. So if you just go to the microphone and just identify yourself for the record, that would be great. And I just want to say we've, heard, you know, we have we have the letters in the packet. We've heard a lot. So um, try to keep it um, salient and to um, points that that need to be addressed, not the, the broader. Okay, thank you. And we will, we have just been supplementing the information provided because as demonstrated today, there's a lot of information missing. Are you sorry. Please, you just state sorry. Oh, sorry. Ann Ramsey Gardner, um, Nine Broadway and Nine Front Street. Um, there has been just an absence of information. So I'm not quite clear how a decision can be made, whether or not this determined, this actually will be harmful to the neighborhood. Um, this, I submitted a, a section, for instance, which should have been one of the main documents um, provided from the beginning to Susan McCarthy, Chairman McCarthy's question, first question at the last hearing, probably the most important question you could ask, how deep is the excavation for this project? Um, and a section was never provided. The, ex, the depth of excavation doubles the height of the, of the cliff um, it goes below the water line and it, it's, it extends below the water table, which goes into another, the other issue that um, Susan Alger mentioned last time about the septic system. I'm not quite sure how you expand a septic system when you're already below the water line. Um, and it extends the angle of repose all the way to Front Street at that depth. 
which that's just to the west, to the north and south, it extends equidistant. So um, I just, I feel like that this, there has been so little information provided to, as to whether or not to determine that this is actually going to be harmful to the neighborhood or not. And I'm not quite sure how you could approve it without additional information. Thank you. Nikki, do you want to call the next? Anne, Relly, you may go ahead. Anne? Okay, Kathy Arve, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Kathy Arve from 11 Front Street. Um, I also agree with everything that has been said to, just to keep it um, from going on too long. I agree with it, what, a, what my other neighbors have um, already stated. I do have a concern. You're talking about the cement wall to the west of the present structure, but how about the cement wall that is um, north? Uh, that cement wall is on our property line as well as a fence, which is actually on our property line um, to the west of the, you know, the present structure. And I don't know if there's plans to do something with that uh, section of the wall, but that's, our, that's on our property. So I don't see how you could. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, while it's fresh in our minds, can you, Michael, can you address uh, Mrs. Arve's concern about that wall being on the on her property and how that's going to be, or Wayne, how that's going to be addressed? Um, so by drilling the piles in, by supporting the top of this excavation, we're expecting little to no damage to anything around this excavation. All these things were based on deflections of the shoring system and the vibrations from installing it. That was the concern for damage of surrounding properties. We're not doing any of that now. Damage to the exist uh, surrounding properties shouldn't be an issue. Okay, so to uh, on that point, so if there is damage, what? What's this, the typical response? Well, all right. So back to the, I think it was the, the attorney. We've, 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 we're saying we're going to offer pre-construction surveys of all the neighbors yeah. that want those. Mm -hmm. So okay. we've never, never said we wouldn't do that. We're, we're still offering that. Okay. Even, even though we're, like I said, we're, we're doing a, a system that's braced and we're not causing any vibrations by its installation. Okay. And then as for the, the wall on the north, that, uh, uh meets up with 11 Front Street. What are the plans for that wall? 11 Front Street. That's the one that the, um, on the, at the back of the lot where the wall that. The L that comes back. That's yeah. The, yeah, that, I, and that's gonna, that's gonna remain. And is there anything changing with that? Nothing, nothing's Nothing. changing with okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, do you, okay, sorry. Well, anyways, so the attorney mentioned about the rubble wall damage. I mean, we said if that if wall is damaged, we will fix it, all right? Um, and there's been a lot of talk about how we're going to change this situation. Actually, I think we're going to improve the situation on Mid Middle Gully Road. By tying that wall back, we're improving that situation by making it more stable, the ground behind it and everything. I, okay. I just wanted to address that. Sure. So then we'll get you. I'm going to go back to you after, but let's let the rest of the people who are on Zoom speak. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, and I just, okay. Sorry. All right, Michael, then Lisa, okay. then back to Zoom. Um, we had possibly, I had asked several questions about insurance. And back when you were going to be using a vibratory uh, tool. Yes. And now that you're not, I don't think that insurance is as important. But just to be, just to be clear, the insurance would be provided by the homeowner by the builder, presumably by your office, because you're sure. insured, yeah. uh, and anyone else that was working on the property. I mean, I can only speak for my company. Yes, we have professional liability coverage, yeah, in general. 
Yeah, typically, in terms of um, the other parties. Well, the the builders needed to get a a permit, basically, uh, and the heavy equipment operator clearly. So I'm comfortable with with the insurance as long as they're not using any vibratory hammer. Okay, um, let's. Thank you for clarifying that because that was one of the things I want uh, that I noted for us to d discuss after we uh, or make sure to circle back to after we heard from everyone. So I think I think you guys what? I just, uh, uh, can you address the neighbors' concerns about the depth of the? Right, that was my... yeah, so mm -hmm. so the elevation, the bottom of this excavation is going to be at elevation I believe seven, a little higher than that. So that's roughly ten feet below Eight Bank Street. That elevation, by the way, is about four to five feet above the stabilized groundwater at the site. Okay. We have a monitoring well, so we're not going to be in the water table. We're going to be a, we're going to be above it. And then, how about the expansion of the septic? System? I'm sorry, what? The expansion of the septic system. I. I can speak. To that. Can we? That's great. But I want to first, before we get to that, say, I know Sarah Elger is going to talk about that as well. I think I'd like to finish with the people on Zoom and then we'll come back to those issues because I think there's, let's get them all out on the table. I just wanted to address for Mrs. Arve, her concerns about the wall. And really? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, I am a butter and a butter at 7 Front Street. And um, I also see that a lot of the things that have been asked for in previous meetings um, by the owners have not been provided. So I'm concerned about going ahead at this point. But uh, my main comment is that this deep excavation build proposal next to Sconset's coastal bank puts way too much at risk. Potentially the collapse of the bank and gully road the underlying water main infrastructure, which supplies Codfish Park, and of course, damage to abutting properties. While we focused in future, in um, previous conversations have focused on economic damage uh, to property, the fact is that once Sconset's bank is gone, it's gone. And that, that's a catastrophic impact to Sconset. I feel the board has grappled with this proposed build and really tried to find a way to say yes, ask for information that over the course of a long period of time and many meetings has not really been provided. And I really feel that at this point, the answer has to be no, uh, when there are substantial risks to the neighborhood. Uh, I don't know why uh, this, this build would be considered in this position. Um, and I urge you not to approve this build. Thank you. Is there anyone else on Zoom? Yes, there's several. Okay. Jesse Richens, state your name for the record and you have the floor. Jesse? Jesse Richens, geotechnical engineer for the gardeners at Nine Broadway. Um, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, we, we, I submitted a letter shortly recently. Um, in short, we appreciate much of the stated improvements for the proposed system monitoring and repair work, but it's difficult to have much confidence when we haven't received anything, um, in written or, uh, or concrete, um, in the past year that we've been uh, requesting many of the improvements, uh, that, were stated in this meeting just now. Um, it's, it's difficult to have a lot of confidence in them and uh, how they will be executed and how they will be designed when we haven't even seen it in writing beyond the statements that were made uh, just now. Okay, thank you. Sarah Elger, do you wanna speak? Yes, Sarah Alger, I represent Wilhelmina Austin. She owns a property at 11 um, Broadway. She's an immediate abutter. Um, I had mentioned concerns at the last meeting, so I, I won't go back through those. I just want to say that this is an enormous project that's going to have a big impact in this area, and it seems really poorly thought out. And that causes me to be very concerned about how this is going to play out. 
we keep hearing promises about they'll fix this and they'll fix that. If this happens, they'll fix it. How do we know that they even have the resources to back up these promises? Um, what, what happens when this goes south, if it goes south, and they aren't able to put it back? They haven't provided any information about what they're doing with their um, septic. They have a one bedroom septic system. It was granted by variance. They're not gonna get a variance to expand that system. So they're gonna have to figure out a way, I think, to do this project to connect to the town sewer, which is up, I believe on Broadway. That's additional disruption to the bank. We haven't even seen proposals about how that would even be done. Um, given all of that, I just don't see how you can find that this project isn't gonna be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what is currently there. And um, I'd ask you to not approve it. Thank you. Next. Pamela Swan, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I actually am um, following Sarah and that was specifically one of the areas I was concerned about is water and septic issues. Um, this, this home is currently advertised as a one bedroom rental on VRBO and all these sites and adding those additional bedrooms and suddenly marketing it as a two or three or four bedroom dwelling is gonna put great stress on it and there is no room for leach fields. Um, I also live at two Broadway and um, agree with the abutters that this is just a dangerous uh, change and sets a horrible precedent for what might happen in the future in Codfish Park with building. Um, thank you. Margaret Van Dusen, go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, Margaret Van Dusen. Um, I just would like to say about the bank that it is a critical line of defense against sea level rise, flooding and upland erosion. And geologically, it's part of the coastal bank on the Eastern shore of the island, irrespective of whether the Conservation Commission regulates it under the town's wetlands bylaw. Um, it's like Two Gully Road, I think that was the number, the recent um, incident where the owner who was transferring the property to the uh, Sconset Trust clear cut the property uh, and allowing uh, this kind of excavation both beneath and then into the coastal bank uh, in this particular area, I think is a is a terrible precedent, but I think it it clearly falls within your um, scope in terms of protecting the health, safety, and general welfare of the inhabitants of Nantucket. So for that reason, um, you know, we'd ask you to deny it. Additionally, if there is going to be dewatering on the property, um, and um, you know, there's no place where that water is going to go except down to the intersection of Beach Street and Codfish Park Road, which Codfish Park Road is already sinking and cracking uh, with increased flooding down there. And so between the groundwater that may well have to be discharged off the site and Mr. McCardle says, well, it's stabilized. Well, that's not what his report says. His original report said groundwater will fluctuate depending on various conditions in this area. Um, obviously, atmospheric conditions, um, things like that will, will um, definitely change the water level. It's not going to be um, static. So based on all of those things, we think you should deny this special permit. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for Zoom so far. I don't see any other hands raised, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, okay. Is there anyone else in the audience that wanted to speak? Uh, Okay, just if you can go to the 
microphone and um, identify yourself and then, Ms. And then Mr. Gar is it Mr. Gardner. Okay. Hi, I'm Lisa Soder, a year round resident at 13 Broadway. And I own, um, I own my, I live here year round. I joined my neighbors in voicing opposition to the applicant's request for the approval of the special permit on the grounds that it not only fails to promote, but will actually jeopardize the health, safety and welfare and structural integrity of one of our, of our country's most important historic districts. As reflected in the comments of my neighbors over the past 14 months, there's a very real risk associated with the proposed deep, deep, deep excavation regardless of whether it has vibration or not, which impacts the stability of the Sconset Bluff, the integrity of Middle Gully Road, that's the emergency access to Codfish Park, and the water supply to Codfish Park. The materials most recently submitted by the applicants do not address these very real, real risks and concerns in writing. Um, as a year-round resident, I believe that it's important that the structures in historic Sconset harmonize with the special um, nature of their, the character of their sites. And, and I just hope that you will ensure that historic Sconset endures by denying this special permit. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Gardner, owner of Nine Broadway, Nine Front Street. Good afternoon. Thank you again for the opportunity to express our concerns regarding the project at 8 Bank Street and Codfish Park. For two years now, property owners in Sconset have followed the rules. Numerous letters have been submitted to both the HDC, ZBA, and Town Council, voicing concerns over the potential damage that could occur should the demolition and dig related to 8 Bank Street be allowed to move forward. Our concerns have fallen on deaf ears how can this be? It is totally bewildering. Why are we being ignored? It is not fair and it is wrong. The scores of letters submitted to the HDC and ZBA have been well-written, very clear expressions of the dismay we feel over the loss of the existing structure and the potential for damage to the abutting properties above the site along Front Street. There should have been no cause for confusion over the meaning of what the residents in Sconset documented in their letters and emails. The record is in fact full of these emails and letters. The project should never have been allowed to reach this point. The risks are many, the community is up in arms. The owners of 8 Bank Street should cherish and appreciate the property they purchased as it is. A comment was made at the last CBA meeting where this issue was given a hearing regarding homeowners insurance. My wife and I consulted with our provider about this and they were aghast that this was even being considered. They informed us that we would have to sustain damage before they could give a completely accurate assessment for a claim. So we must wait for the damage to occur before we can begin to plan a recovery. Living with this concern daily is not quiet enjoyment of one's home. Again, it is not fair. A sure way to avoid this potential risk is to leave everything as it is. Do no harm. Do not dig. Please do not approve this request. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else in the audience have anything to say at this point? No. I have a question for Mr. McArdle. Sure. Mr. McArdle, uh, Member O'Mara has a question for you. What is the plan, assuming you have one, if the groundwater actually is higher than you expect and um, you notice it during construction? Um, so right now, uh, the game plan is if there's groundwater, if we encounter higher groundwater during construction, which by the way, we do not anticipate, the groundwater out there does fluctuate, there's no doubt about it, but we're talking about, you're talking about fluctuations of five or six feet, it would have to fluctuate that much for it to come into this excavation. We don't expect that, and that would be untypical. 
of the groundwater elevations in that area. So, but if we did, if that happened during construction, there would have to be dewatering that would have to occur during construction. Just, like, just during construction. Just during construction, yeah. Well, what about after construction? The, the basement has been designed with, uh, with a under drain system below the slab. Any water that got up to the slab would be drawn into that system and ejected. Ejected where? Out under the site. To one side of the building, I don't know. That would be um, Jeff Blackwell's. That falls into his his realm. Um, and but like I said, we've, we've said before, we don't expect groundwater to be an issue or even fluctuations. The reason I've recommended an underdrain system is because you're there once to do install something like that. Trying to install it after the fact is difficult. So we think it's worth the uh, extra mm -hmm. added security just to do it anyway. We actually don't even expect it to ever work. Okay. Um, and have you, do you have a septic plan at this point or? I, again, that's not my, I do not have okay. a septic plan. Michael, can you address that? I can, thank you. I represented the uh, past owner of this property. When she transferred the property to um, your applicants, she was obligated to upgrade to a fully compliant um, Title V system, which is what is for on one the bedroom or for, multi, for more than one bedroom? The one bedroom it's compliant it's compliant it now. was installed in 2018 right the question is is when you go to the basement and add the rec room if that's another bedroom but it's not it is well it, it was is the way the board of health would interpret it now but it well, is not a bedroom it's a rec room it is a bedroom because there's a full <clears throat> bath down there that's how the board of health constitutes a bedroom yeah you and rid I, of the shower you can have that space I thought, and I thought, and forgive me if I'm remembering wrong or confusing it with another application, but, and I looked in my notes, but I thought that the applicants were planning on living in this space. And I thought there were more than two people in the family unit that were going to be living in the space. Well, they're married and, they, and he lives here year round, works here on the island. She works in Boston. They have children. And so this, this is not their primary. So it's not going to be. Where are the children is, going in the summer? <laughs> <laughs> like if it's not a bedroom and you're four or there's more than one child. I can't answer where the children are going to go. Uh, OK, summer. but I'm just saying like it was a bedroom. I have plans with two twin beds. Right, and, but that, that was um, eliminated and modified and it is not a bedroom. But the board, the, the board of health would, would address and have to weigh in on any change on the septic, not the zoning have, So the, has the plan. I'm just curious, like, has the plan for use of this property then changed from what was originally presented to us? So the only um, change is the elimination of any bedroom space that would have been below grade. So that it is a compl compliant one bedroom house with a compliant Title V system. So there's no, so there's, so you're not going to be upgrading the septic as was discussed in November from one bedroom to two bedroom. Nope. And it's not going to be listed on rental sites as a two bedroom rental. I have, if, if you want to make that a condition of the board, uh, I'm not really sure where you're going with that. Well, it's you just don't want so, them to rent it. No, no, I'm no, not no, saying no, I don't no, want no, them to rent no. it. I'm just saying that I had, I remember a very impassioned presentation about how this was you know, a, a house that was going to be kept in the family and that the family unit was going to use this house and this and that, but it doesn't seem that this plan, what the family wants to do with the house, doesn't seem that it's able to do given the septic system, which that came up later. And now the plan only it's, you know, now it's one bedroom going to remain one bedroom, although the plans as shown, it is considered a two bedroom. Madam Chair, all I can say is that the applicant was sensitive to the board's concerns and changed their plans based on what they heard the board's concern was. So they went to the one bedroom. They okay. removed, That's consistent with what right. you'd asked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they removed the bunk beds, but the space is essentially the same. Well, dimensionally. Yes. <laughs> So, you know, my feeling, and I'm only one member, is that I'm, I'm not prepared to approve or deny this today. I would like to see further information and geotechnical plans. I'd like to see everything. Geotechnical plans for which component? 
for the uh, tying the existing uh, concrete wall back into the bank, okay. where the new pilings are going to go, how it relates to the window wells, all that information, I think, has to be more clearly presented to us and give the uh, neighbors consultants the ability to read it and uh, respond. Madam Chair, do window wells fall within zoning purview? No, but how they interact with your system does fall within, I believe, our zoning purview. So it's the, you want geotechnical information about the uh, tie I want a plan of how they're going to do this so that their consultant can look at it and and understand it and give any concerns. I, don't, I mean, you know, hopefully that can happen in a month and then we can just come back and although I won't be here in March, that can be uh, evaluated by their consultants and we can move on from there. I just don't think there's enough information put down on paper for anybody to respond to all these what ifs. But a lot of what ifs are hypothetical and I'm just trying to pin down what specifically you would like to see. And if it's the geotechnical plans- I'd like for to see a plan the where the pilings are gonna be, pilings. how that relate to the existing foundation, the existing concrete wall that has now appeared on the plan, how they plan to support that uh, and its relationship to the new foundation and the new peer plan and the window wells and all that, all that stuff I think has to be more clearly represented. I think it would also be helpful for you to go to the Board of Health in advance of a full submission and get them to approve your plans and bring us a stamp set of those. Mm -hmm. You're asking the applicants to go to the Board of Health for what? To say that this is only gonna be a one bedroom house and they don't have to upgrade their septic system. You can do that in advance of getting a building permit. I've certainly gotten their interpretation on plans ahead of time. So I'm not clear what you're asking the applicant to do before they come back here. I think what you're saying is you're asking the applicant to apply to the board of the board of health for the board of health to determine this is a one bedroom. To, to, to show them their existing conditions plans, their proposed plans and say, will this still be considered one bedroom house or will we have to upgrade the septic system? It's a very simple question. You're not, you don't even have to give an application. You can just say, this is what we're planning. Mm -hmm. Will you approve this as a one bedroom house? So not looking for a hard, a hard no. formal approval, just an interpretation or exactly. some confirmation from the board of health that this is as, as shown on these plans is a one bedroom. Because you have two you have board members saying that the way that the bathroom is, the full bathroom in the basement constitutes a one bedroom. And one board member said remove a shower. And, and if you take a shower out of a bathroom, it, sure it eliminates a bedroom. I think I think it's I think you can no, you can ask the board of health for their opinion on that. Right, right. We're not the board of health. And I'm just saying for you, your protection, frankly, I think it makes sense to go ahead and get an interpretation now mm -hmm. on that because that's a big issue of whether or not this is feasible. Would that not arise at the building department stage? No. <clears throat> well, it would, but why would you wait? I guess my question is, why would you wait to do that if it's a simple interpretation and you're sure if your interpretation is correct? Why wouldn't you just go get that? Oh, this is the first you've asked of it. So I'm, it's, it's sort of new um, for this applicant to be told, go to well, the board of health, find something before you come back to the zoning okay. board. I, I would, I'm trying to get a handle I, on I what you're asking the Board with, of Health with to. Lisa on this. And I think that if I were the applicant, I would have already done that. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of razzle dazzle in this application. And we, we could have been finished with it if, we, if we'd known that, yes, it can be a, 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 an upgraded one bedroom structure. Uh, but I, I question. Uh, whether it's going to get approval the way it is. At and the I, Board of Health? Yes. And if I also, the Board of Health has to weigh in on it, which I don't, I don't understand how the, any, they would have to weigh in. Any building permit application before it goes to the building department goes to the Board of Health and gets stamped by them, whether or not you think it should go. You know, even if you do, I was in a bar, didn't have a bathroom in it. They want to see it. They want to make sure it's not too close to the leaching fields. Everything goes to them in advance of the building department. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I can assure you that before any work is done, all of the applications would have to go through the permitting process. I just, I, I'm, I'm confused about the zoning board asking for information from the Board of Health. 
I as think part of the zoning board's I, decision -making I think process. because the public has brought up a very good concern about the septic system and its expandability and whether or not it's going to be able to service this building and if not if you're going to do a sewer uh, issue how is that going to take place so there is and no proposal changes. before this board or any board to expand the septic system and there's no proposal to add bedrooms to this property mm -hmm. so um, if, if the board wants more information and one of the pieces of the information is an opinion from the board of health on whether the Board of Health is going to approve a building permit application. I just need to be clear on what my applicants whether, are being Whether asked or not they do. consider the, with the, the drawings for the basement a rec room or a bedroom. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then I think also um, the um, what Mr. McArdle said about the um, the drain, the sub drain, uh, and if there is runoff, I think it would be helpful for the neighbors since uh, several have brought up uh um where that where any water is going to go it would be helpful to know what the plan is um whether that and i thought at some point that the applicant did say that the water was going to be dispersed back onto the site but today i heard either the side or you know i think we would want to know where that runoff is planned to that go was, madam chair that was brought up through um Mr. O'Mara, and it was addressed, the question that was raised by the abutter about the suggestion of um, on-site pumping of water was specifically raised by Mr. O'Mara. Mr. McArdle, in my recollection, said that part of the plan was for rainwater, which is consistent with the abutter's statement today about atmospheric conditions. Mm -hmm. Mr. McArdle's information suggests that groundwater is at the closest five feet away from the lowest point of ex excavation and that there would be no need for dewatering of a site during construction or post-construction unless you saw a five plus or minus foot swing in groundwater which is unlikely right. but I prefer to, um, Wayne on that he did say uh, like a lot of people do you put suspenders on a belt while you've got this hole open why wouldn't you put a system under the slab if for some reason at any point in the future you, you'd need to turn it on, but in his opinion, it would never need to be turned on. Well, I guess the question is, is if it had to be turned on, where would the water go? Even if it's hypothetical. Can you just discharge on site? Can you he said discharge on, on site. On site. Okay. I'd like to just... And I could go back through yeah. some other points that if the board wanted any answers, I know that Mr. Mondani had a question. Okay, let's go to Elisa and then to Jim and then um, and Leslie has her hand up and we we are we only have an hour and a half left for this meeting today and it seems at least I just want to breathe. I, I was going to say at least three I think at least three people on the board have said that they would want to continue so I think that's where we're headed so let's try to figure out. I just want to step back and and again I sometimes I'm just want to reiterate we are here because of the front and I say front next to the front door. This is in front of the ZBA because of the five by five square foot area of roof. this structure. That, that is correct. The small triangular portion of the roof plane that currently sits within the zoning setback is and going if, to if at the end of the not, project would be about um, right, a foot so taller. If, so if, if you were not asking for that, you wouldn't even be in front of us. Yeah, in fact, if we shrunk the basement and didn't adjust the height of that, yeah, I don't think any zoning relief would be needed. And, then, and this is the point I made last meeting is that all this could be done except for this five by five foot thing. And right. I think we're yeah. expanding our scope. If I, And I understand the neighbor's concern, but the homeowner has an engineer where they're bringing up concerns with no engineering. Mm -hmm. If the water table is above that level, let's see it so that the engineers can dispute what they're claiming. Right. I think we're going to address these things, and I fear that the neighbors will bring up other things, fire, whatever. And then we as a board are, are expanded even further. Yeah, I, just, I don't have the engineering background to review uh, tie-in plans water. and all. You know who does? The town does someplace else. And yeah. I just want to remind system. everyone that it's about a five by five that, foot that's what section. I'm, that's what I want. That's just triggering discuss. all this. I mean, and I we're am, required to review yeah, engineering plans 
and, yeah. and actually have a greater role than the building department and and the and the uh, health department. And I, I just don't understand. Yeah, I just work. wanted to this go back to, go to the forever, beginning of why this continue. is even in front of us, and it's for that triangular five by dog. five. Whatever, That's correct. I, I, I'm comfortable with so this, but I'm why would you redesign this so that you don't have to come in front of us? Well, it sounds like you're going to get a denial, but anyway, just thinking out loud here. Um, I think if and, you, you, you put your finger on it, uh, you know, Alan, if you look at the, the purpose of the zoning code and what's going to be in the neighborhood at the end of the project, a, a very small triangular portion of the roof plane is going to be a one foot taller. So for the board to take a butter positions that that is going to be substantially more detrimental, I think is, is not the, the argument to be made. And I, I do think it that really the should homeowner be. should be credited for agreeing to not doing the vibrational um, plates, go, doing it right. in that sort of right. a way. I mean, really. I think that will, in a huge way, and I'm not qualified to say, you know, this much to it, but in my experience, that is going to be a lot less impactful on abutter properties and surrounding properties. And, you know, there is a lot of work going on down in Codfish Park. So, and it's not illegal to want to improve your house. And thank you. They do not have to leave their house exactly the way it is. They sure. have a right to, to build a new structure and improve upon what they have. And I just need, you know, everybody is in a frenzy that they shouldn't be allowed to build anything there. This is America, for God's sake. They can build a house there that is within, you know, the rules. So I am not in favor of completely denying this. I think there's a lot more that needs to happen, but I think they have a right to build the house they want. I just think it needs to fall within all of the different boards, rules, and regulations. But for the relief that we need at this board, my clients are willing and, and want nothing but to be completely compliant with every other aspect of what the town requires for the use of that property. Plain and simple. There's nobody here trying to ask to get away with anything. And there is groundwater problems all over this island. Every project I'm involved with, at least half of them it's talked about or it actually happened. So I understand we need to figure out where it's going to get pumped to in that case. So figure it out because that happens all over Nantucket. Well, we do have scientifically reliable data that says that is uh, speculative at best that you're going to see groundwater go up six feet, five feet. Well, it, you know, if it does, you're putting in the system for a reason. So, right. okay. If it has to be used, where is it getting pumped to? That's a legitimate question, but otherwise, you know, I, I'm not up for denying it. Thank you. Leslie, you had something to say. I do um, I have a few things. Um, first of all, I think that, you know, the board has asked for a lot of information over the past several months and you've been provided all or most of that. A lot of it is way outside of your jurisdiction, but I think it was helpful for you all to hear it and for the neighbors to hear and to have their concerns um, voiced and responded to in some way. Um, the site plan review section of the bylaw, which is what a lot of this is about, um, exempts single family dwellings. So none of that really applies to your review. But again, I understand why you asked for it. Um, the Board of Health, you know, if, if the new construction doesn't meet their regulations, they'll deal with that. I'm very strict about it. And, you know, state law says that you all can't regulate the interior of a single family dwelling. So getting into the number of bedrooms isn't something that you all can regulate anyway. Um, again, the finding for this is the substantially more detrimental finding. Um, and that's what you all need to focus on relative to the, um, the addition that they're putting on. And then the last thing is the action deadline for this is February 23rd. So they would have to grant an extension or you all would have to make a decision today. Well, so I thought that coming in here today, we would we would be making a decision. Um, 
but I don't, I don't know that we're there. Lisa, you're looking for, or you're interested in seeing inf more information based on the exist, the, the new plan, the new plan of action. Is yeah, because we don't even have a pile, pile plan that relates to the work. And, and again, I think I voiced, I don't have any issue with the, with the special permit aspect of the roof raising. That's not what we're discussing here. I do think that the means and methods for something that's in an area like this is potentially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And I just wanna make sure that it's well executed and well thought out. And I'm not an engineer and I can't, I guess, make that determination, but the um, abutters have an engineer um, that can do peer review and make them feel more comfortable with it. I think the changing of the architecture of the building, I agree with Elisa, it's completely, you know, they went through the process, they got HGC approval. Um, it is going to be a bigger building, um, but that's okay. Buildings change, they've changed historically, you know, for 300 years. So that I don't have as much of an issue with. It's, it's just making sure that, we have everything in our packet that shows the process that they're going to take to do this. And yes, the five by five is the part of it that needs the zoning relief, but having that need for zoning relief opens up the discussion. And right. the, the, I would say 80% of this conversation has been to work with the neighbors to get them to a place where they are comfortable in understanding what is happening and happening in their neighborhood. And like Elisa said, I agree the change from vibrational to, mm -hmm. um, to the, the, um, drilling, newly presented drilling. drilling plan, um, takes a lot of the, a lot of those concerns away. Um, so I guess it's, the voting on this we have is Lisa, Elisa, Michael, myself, and Jim. Um, so that's the sitting board on this. So Elisa, I think earlier you were looking to make a motion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still am. And it seems like What, okay. Does anyone on the board have anything that they questions or anything else at this point? Um, despite what Leslie said, huh. um, I still think I'd still like to hear what the Conservation Commission has to say about it. And um, I was planning on voting today before I came here. And I was, as I mentioned earlier, I was happy to receive all the information we've been waiting for. Um, and I am, am leaning towards approving it, but I'd rather wait and hear what everyone has to say and then make a decision. And uh, unfortunately, I will not be here next month. Neither will I. So uh, you won't be here in the room or you won't be able to be on Zoom. Because I won't be here physically, but I'll be able to be on Zoom. Um, I guess, uh, let me think about that. What about you? I could arrange it, I think. I could too, it would be. But you're saying the action deadline is the 20, what did you say, the 21st, 23rd, Leslie? So we still need an extension. 23rd, so we still need an extension, which the applicant has to agree to, correct? Do you guys think you could get more information by March 9th? If I have a very, yes, if I have a very clear understanding of what we're looking for, and I just heard from Mr. O'Mara, he wants us to go to the Conservation Commission. So if there is a wetland resource area protected under the Wetland Protection Act, we will certainly have to do that, but that's new. Well, uh, excuse me, I, I, I made a mistake. I, I misspoke. Health I meant the, the health office. Health department. Yeah. Okay. Health department. Board of health. So you want to hear from the health department if yeah. they've determined that this is a one bedroom. I just need to thing. know, like, yeah, I, what I the board wants, so if, we can we can budget I, I the think time we need to. Satisfy. Perhaps Bill could pencil a a letter to the health health department. 
Why, why wouldn't the applicant do it? Well, Just ask me what you want me to ask the health department and I'll do okay, it. Okay, you take the draw. It, <clears throat> what I've done in the past is email I just want John. to know what, what question you want answered. I'm not sure I have that yet. How show many them, bedrooms this, this? Yeah, show okay. them the proposed plan and say, how do you interpret this for the number of bedrooms? Number of bedrooms. Got it. Agreed. That's all you have to, they say it's one Can bedroom still that? with the rec room. That's all, that's all we need to know. And in terms of the plan, I think at one point we did have a plan that showed your sheet pile locations and all that. Uh, that was back when it was vibratory. Right. Now we're drilling so, it to, to, so to it, reduce it would still be nice to eliminate. see the plan of what you propose to do. Structure. And you and you're talking about a geotechnical engineer that's you're working with, getting you know just understanding. So the so location and the number of pilings. I, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. we couldn't approve this with the um, condition of getting determination from the Board of Health. And remember, we're not doing anything until the I fall. Just think, just, I mean, the Board of Health thing, I think is just, I think is just for clarification. I mean, it's not, it doesn't, and I wasn't talking about the, um, the, the two beds or numbers of bedrooms. I get that that's not our jurisdiction, but it's just, the narr I'm just, just clarifying on the narrative of how this has been presented. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't, if the Board of Health is gonna call it two bedrooms at some point, they're gonna have to, re because of the way the bathroom is, they'll have to redo that bathroom. Yeah, but we'll just, I, I will tell you that the design will be, it Whatever it needs to be to be one that bedroom the to be has to determine that. No, Madam Chair, I yeah. can I can tell the board now. I'll represent to the board that this is only going to be one bedroom, and that the existing Title Five one bedroom septic system, which is very new, is not going, as a result of this construction. They will not do anything to require a modification of of the bedroom count that relates to the existing Title Five septic system. So what we're not will going you do into town sewer. Are we're not digging go, up. Michael, are you gonna if you get denied today? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna go redesign this, or are you gonna live in the house as is? I'm just curious. Like, uh, I'm not gonna let you deny it. I'm gonna give you what you want to approve it. <laughs> okay, that's less of an issue to me. I still think having you know Wayne mentioned that they, they were gonna go to a get a geotechnical another engineer involved in this to help design some of these issues. <laughs> Right. So I, I guess I just don't know why we don't have a plan that you would be able to send to somebody to say, this is what we want to do. This is how it's going to work. That would allow the neighbors to send it to their engineer. That's why, I, you know, that's my concern about. All right. All right. Well, I'm asking for engineer plan for calculation on all the design of the tie back. I don't know. You had a plan in here before that, that for? for the sheet pilings. No, and the sheet pilings is one thing. I'm saying the tiebacks is another thing that requires us to get. A, I like think it's, it's, to, to me, this. it's the integration of this existing foundation wall, this existing concrete block wall that exists sure. and how it relates to the building that's there and the window walls that are there and just tying a little ribbon around how this is all going to work. Okay. And if that's going to make any changes to the plan, I just want to know about it. Sure, and we can show, I can show graphically a lot of that stuff. All I'm yeah. saying is there's going to be having a geotechnical I don't need to look at their calculations okay. because I don't know what, you know, I'm not an engineer, but I sure. just think having in the packet a very clear set of drawings that shows how this is going to end up given the site conditions and given that wall that you discovered is, you know, further along the building and all that was and I think that's helpful. That should be in our packet. Right. That's where we started with all of this at the first application of the first presentation of the application was saying, this is what we usually require in a situation like this. And you guys did provide it when it was the, the old methodology. Right. Now you've changed the methodology. You just have to provide the same thing again, but for the new methodology, sure. I think you're hearing positive feedback from the sure. board as far as um, mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. forward. We just, like Lisa said, we just need to tie it in a neat bow to have make sure that that information is is in there. Sure, and I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. I just want to make sure we don't get to a situation where the the uh, neighbors consultant as well. You know, they didn't include this calculation or that calculation. I just don't. 
I don't know. At least I mean, a, you know, at a certain point, right? Like anything, you can hire a lawyer that's going to say one thing, and, uh, and then the next right. week they'll say something else if right. that's their client. Sure. So I understand that there's going to. Well, I'm sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> an architect too would do the same thing. That's, <laughs> that's fine. I'll update the plans to show our revised, and a, a, it'll have. Um, but all those details, all the details of what we, what yeah. we want to do and how we're going to do it. What's proposed, and I think that sure. might affect the architectural plans a little bit with those window wells. Sure. Maybe they become nice. even shorter transoms. So that, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, and they're not three lights high, they're just one light high. Sure. Just okay. all that stuff. That, that is helpful. something that contradicts on the, the plan. window wells, contradict where that retainage is happening. Yeah. Exactly. That doesn't. That doesn't okay, so let's drive. clean up the contradictions. Get a plan that shows what's what's being drilled in where. Mm -hmm. um, confirmation or just an interpretation from the Board of Health, if, if available and able to able to be done. Um, I'm going to let you say one quick thing, and then we have to move on. We, we yeah. have to. And, and I would just say, if you can have that by March 9th, I'll, I'll, I can zoom in. It'll okay. be early in the morning for me, but I'll do that. If not, we'll just do it in April. Okay. Yep. So and number of bedroom opinion. And structural plans, how the wall site conditions, the new Trace methodology are going to impact the, the, uh, the no. wall and the window yeah. walls. I would consider it to more. Yeah. Speak she, I was okay. Sorry. One one quick thing, then Leslie. Then we ha we got to move on. For clarification sure. on the geotechnical issues, we respectfully request that our geotechnical engineer has written two letters summarizing and on in response to the. September VPAC, we issued a letter October 5th that summarizes issues of concern and missing documentation for the geotechnical to be fully understood. So could you guys refer to that document? I don't know what page it is in the packet. Is it the March 9th hearing? Is that where we're uh... Unless you guys want to put it off till April. Yeah. Uh, I think March. I think. No, oh, can... I'm talking about the issues of concern for. Uh, a list from October 5th. Did we get this in our packet? So. March 9th, we can we will okay. we will make that happen. Okay. Yes. And you'll read this memo, Wayne. October 5th. 2022. Who was it sent to? It just, it just says eight bank street construction risk management response to report 9822 view pack. So who's, if you can, so who's the you, author, uh, their engineer, Jesse, I assume it's Jesse. And you guys can talk about that offline, right? Yeah. Like you're, you, yes, you can absolutely. try to talk about that and, and work those things yeah, out right. because that, that is outside of our scope and our area of expertise. That is yeah, not, yeah. those are not absolutely. things like if, if your geotech has it, it's concerns for his geotech, they need to work together. And for the record, we grant the uh, extension Thank for you. the um, action deadline and we'll be back March 9th. Okay, so thank you very much. Can someone motion make a motion to continue to March 9th? Yes. Um, I'll make that motion. Okay, so Jim makes the motion, Elisa seconds, or Elisa no. made it, Jim seconds. Um, and the voting uh, members are Lisa, Elisa, Michael, myself, and Jim. All those in favor of continuing to March 9th, please say aye. 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 Can we get an action deadline extension through April 1st? We'll be in the office tomorrow. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Moving on to uh, 123 and 323 uh, FAO nominee trust, 23 and 29 Orange Street, uh, Rick Baudet presenting for the applicant. Um, I'm happy to step. I, I did the original application for this, but I don't have any further conflicts. But if anybody else wants to sit in, I can sit off. Why don't you sit off? What page is that? Um, did it's I sit three, on this? It's 371. This is new. No. The old one, you mean? Yeah, 371. The old, uh, 371. Here we go. Got it. Okay. Uh, our client sold to them, but I don't necessarily think there's a conflict. Unless you did. Your client sold to them. Yeah, I don't think no. it's a conflict. No. Oh, thank. So I just have to say I'm recused. Yeah. Okay, Rick, you're on. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll uh, I'll try to keep keep this brief. I know you guys have a short meeting here today and a, a number of other matters. So, uh, Rick Bodet for the applicant FAO nominee trust. And I realize 
uh, looking at the application and, and speaking to Leslie as well, that uh, uh, since we've, we have to make two applications, it's two separate properties. Uh, each of those uh, properties has special permits uh, that relate to it, that uh, the application and addendum, long addendum we provided is a little bit confusing, but I can assure you uh, the application and what we're asking for is actually very, very simple. Um, in a few words, uh, there is a pool on 23 Orange Street, and all we are seeking to do is change the property line so that the pool is on 29 Orange Street. That's it. Um, but of course, uh, there's a procedure to get there and, and relief we need from you guys to do it. So, um, so just a bit, little bit of background. I'll start with 23 Orange Street. Uh, it's a pre-existing non-conforming lot pre-existing non-conforming structure on it. There is a special permit that exists on this property. It's about 20 years old, uh, related to an addition that was done and a little bit of ground cover that was added. And specifically uh, relevant to this application is that there's a condition in that decision that says uh, they can't increase ground cover without relief from this board. Okay, it was, I think, 34, 35% ground cover, 36. Um, and they can't increase ground cover without relief from that board. There is also a pre-existing non-conforming pool on 23 Orange Street. That was built somewhere around 2010 before the prohibition came into effect. And now 29 Orange Street, my client has owned for about 10 years. Uh, it is also pre-existing non-conforming. It's an oversized lot, but the structure is pre-existing non-conforming. Uh, that also has a special permit attached to it relative to an addition. Um, and in terms of the current status and where we are today, my client bought 23 Orange Street in large part to do exactly what we're doing today. Uh, it was a short-term rental and was rented frequently in the summer. <clears throat> the pool, as you can see from the site plan, is very close to the 29 Orange Street property line. And it was a, a real issue for my clients. Um, so uh, they purchased 23 Orange Street uh, in an effort to annex the pool to their own property, control it, that way they won't have to worry about um, all the short-term rental issues. Uh, so last year, what, what I did is I had, I put the properties into common ownership. We did a 4181L to, uh, to redivide the lot lines under the current bylaw and under uh, 81L of the subdivision control law. So what you have before you, I think you can see on your, on exhibit B that we submitted, uh, are the properties with the new with the new property lines. And you can see the pool is part of what will be now be the 29 Orange Street property. Uh, the relief we are requesting, a couple of specific requests uh, by special permit. Number one, with respect to 23 Orange Street, we're asking to change that condition in the, in the special permit to allow us to go to 49% ground cover. When we take property away from 23 Orange Street and give it to 29 Orange Street, that causes the ground cover to go somewhere from about 36% up to 49. So that's the first request we're asking for. The second request is relative to 29 Orange Street. We have a pre-existing non-conforming pool. We wanna alter that pre-existing non-conforming use to allow it to be on 29 Orange Street. That in a nutshell is exactly what we're asking for. The standard you have to review that by is whether uh, this is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than it is today. Uh, obviously, we would suggest to you that it isn't any more detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, it's really no change at all. The only difference is uh, the pool is on 29 rather than 23. And that's it. I can answer, hopefully, any questions you guys have. Do any of the neighbors think it's more detrimental to the neighborhood? I don't know. We haven't heard anything. I don't know uh, if anyone else has. Um, I, I assume not. but. Um, can't speak for them. I, we haven't heard from them. Okay. Does the board have any questions for Rick? So does moving the lot line put the pool in any setbacks? No, we've specifically uh, kept it kept it out of the setbacks intentionally. Okay. So there's nothing new non-conforming. There's well, nothing- Other than the 49% going from the 36. Yes. For the ground cover on 49. On 23. 23. Yes. <laughs> 23. Yes, that, you know, um, 
So yeah, that's a good point. To, yeah. that, and, and reminds me that I forgot to mention something that if there wasn't a special permit on 23 that required us to, to come, come back, back here, it's because it's an 81 L uh, it would just automatically be pre-existing yep. non-conforming. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a technically everything on there is pre-existing non-conforming even though we did it just last year. Uh, but because of that condition, we had to come back here. And ask mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. I'm ultimately, I think I'm fine with this. I, I've looked at it more than I'd care to admit. Okay. <laughs> um, seeing that there's no, there's no letters and there's, uh, does it, is there anyone in the audience to speak on this one? No, anyone on zoom? Okay. If there's no, doesn't seem like there's any questions. It seems pretty straightforward. Would someone like to make a motion? Sure. I will make a motion to grant the relief as requested to modify the existing special permit to increase the ground cover to, I think we say 49%. On 23, yes. On 23. And uh, I would call it the va validation of the swimming pool as pre existing non conforming. Unless. And that's fine with me. And if I may, uh, one, one other thing I wanted to mention that I, I assume the board would want to keep in place is each of these special permits has a condition that says no exterior construction, Further. you know, whatever it is, Labor Day to, to Memorial Day. So I assume the board would want to keep something in there that says all other conditions remain the same. Right. So we'd amend, amend the special permit, keep the other, and keep the, um, the other conditions. Um, do you want anyone to second? Second. Okay, so voting on this one, um, we'll, Mark, you wanna start with you and we'll move across? Aye. Aye. Oh, Lisa, you're out. Uh, myself, aye. Aye. And John. Aye. Okay, so that's 23. And then for 29, I don't think you need to go into explanation. Um, double any questions on 29? Do you want to make the motion again, John? Uh, I do. Sure. Um, I, I would move to uh, approve the re relief as requested. Second. Okay, so John made the motion. Elisa seconded. Same same voting across. So, aye. Elisa, aye. myself, I, Michael, aye. and John. Aye. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next. Um, are we still doing, are we still doing, we're not, are we doing 0223 or no? We can continue. We're, we're at a lane you are. Okay. Is Cohen on Zoom? Okay. Oh, he's coming over as a panelist. One sec. Oh, there he is. Go ahead, Stephen. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with my camera, but um, I'm not sure you need to see me anyway. Um, so this is a situation where my client has a lot that is uh, an unusual shape. Um, and part of that is you know, it's a big rectangle with a little little tail on the side, which I, you can see it in your plan. And a significant portion of the lot is essentially unbuildable because of uh, wetlands and intermittent stream and other things that run through it. So the house is way off on uh, the northeast corner. Um, I think it's actually a Botticelli and pole design. I'm not sure that matters, but uh, I believe it is. The renovation and, of, of an existing building. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, irrelevant to the application. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the southwest corner, um, my client installed a, um, a solar array. The solar array, before we installed it, we went, uh, I emailed the zoning enforcement officer and asked him under Mass General Law 40A section three, if um, the zoning setbacks would apply. And he responded to me that all efforts should be made to comply with zoning setbacks, but putting a solar array within the setback is not considered to be a violation of the Nantucket zoning bylaw. That was in 2019, I believe. Um, 
So we applied to the HDC and got permission. We applied to the building department and got a building permit. And then we closed out that building permit in 2020. Um, no one has complained. There's no zoning enforcement action. And we could have just sat on it uh, and, and, you know, whatever. Actually, there was no reason to sit on it because we were not under the impression that there was an issue. Um, recently, my client um, went under contract to sell uh, that lot. And the buyer of the lot wants to make sure that he's not going to have any problem getting building permits due to the um, solar array being within the setbacks. And when we inquired, the building commissioner told us that he does consider um, zoning uh, solar arrays to be required to comply with setbacks to the extent uh, possible. Uh, there, are, there are some exceptions, but, this, but he uh, said that we uh, needed to comply. Um, he was not going to bring an enforcement action and told me I could just, you know, wait it out if I wanted to. But because my client, because the buyer wants to be, make sure that they're able to get building permits, uh, we're instead seeking a, a variance. The variance is based on the shape and topography of the lot, which renders most of the lot unbuildable. And also the fact that it would cost a hundred to $150,000 to relocate the array, even, you know, if we, if we had to, if we could. Um, Ron Winters, I believe is in the audience and can testify to the details on that if the board wants to hear about it. Um, I'm hoping the board will just grant the variance. Um, the, the other thing I should point out is that this lot only has one neighbor. And so, you know, my client owned both of the lots. Uh, one is 21 Pacama Road and the other one is 7 Loretta Lane. And my client owned both of them and sold one. So essentially he is his own, you know, the, the buyer of the, of the lot is one neighbor and then my client is the other neighbor. And the only other, uh, there's no other neighbor except for the road. If you look at the photographs that were submitted, this um, solar array is essentially uh, invisible due to the dense uh, scrub oak and other vegetation, native vegetation in the area. And obviously we'd have no uh, intention to uh, take that out because it would expose my client's property to, to, the, to the road. Um, you know, so there's, no, there's obviously no, no desire to open that up. Um, so because there's no impact on anyone who's not either the applicant or the seller, uh, of the property in question, um, there's no there's no real impact on anyone here. Um, so I'd, I'd ask the board to grant the variance on those grounds. Anyone on the board have any questions for Mr. Collins? Anyone have any questions for, for the building commissioners in that? Oh, sorry. Uh, no one has any questions for Mr. Cohen, Attorney Cohen. Does anyone have any questions for the building commissioners in the audience? <laughs> Actually, I have a question for Mr. Cohen. So you uh, is there any documentation in, in here that uh, permitted the installation of these? There's an, e there's an email from Steve Cohen on page 430 from Marcus. 430? Yeah, and then there's the um, building permit application and then there's the CL yeah, okay. for the whatever that would be called. So just yep. for the compliance for completion. Sorry. Yes, completion. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and we've seen a couple of these before. The difference was that they weren't signed off on and um, where, also, where, the, where the, the opinion from the town changed over over time and there was a neighbor and there were one of them right. that was agreed and this one if, and i if i'm trying to read it if, am i correct that what's the intrusion in the setback steven that's it's only a foot uh, and a half away from the property. yeah because of the because of the thin shape of the lot it's a very significant intrusion it's i think it's like you know a foot and a half from one side yeah. five or ten feet on the other side mm -hmm. you know it's a significant intrusion but it's because the, the, the lot is basically a thin uh, tail in that area. I'm, I'm just curious, do they put it at that slight angle and not stay perpendicular to the road just because it was better exposure? Uh, yeah, that's better? correct. Oh, yeah, for, yeah. yeah, for efficiency. It's just off just a little bit. I mean, I know, I know the lot is extremely wet. There's really no other buildable area other than where the house sits. There'd be no other place to put an array. I don't have a issue with it given the circumstances. Yeah, I don't either. Um, 
Anyone in the audience have anything to say on this one? I may be conflicted. Okay, then you can back out. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Um, before we make the motion, do sure. we, we put anything in related to no additional? Yeah, we can say no, no additional um, intrusion in the setback without further relief from the board. Um, and it would cost a hundred plus thousand to move it from where it is to within the setbacks. Is that well, right? That's what it says that's on the says. email. Yeah, yeah from Ron, the um, Ron is here. Yeah, it says for the ZBA. Uh, Sorry, the estimate for relocation of the solar array that states that it would cost over $100,000, 40 to 50 for site prep, trenching and repair the landscape. So you add that to the 58,000 for the latest pricing and that was from January. Hi. Hi. Ron Winters from Stewart's. Um, the actual installation would not fit in the strip. Right. It's wider than the, the amount of land that would be in the setback. So even if it wasn't, uh, facing the sun, it wouldn't have fit in there. Uh, when we applied for the building permit, it was actually done through Act Solar, uh, and Steve Cohen was a, assured by the zoning officer that that would be not a problem, it would be in compliance, or we would have dealt with it at the time because it was certainly a question of mind when we were doing it. So uh, I believe that the building inspector has signed off on it at that time. Um, and I think that, not that they're planning on doing any building there, but for the owner uh, that would be purchasing the property, um, depending on the deter determination of what the frontage of that property would be, could further bring this up. So we're trying to get this behind uh, on this property that it's uh, in zoning compliance through a ZBA on finding. Right, so I would only say that uh, that I would grant this 1.8 setback only because of the solar panels and no other structure. Right, limited right. to the limited, limited to, to this solar panel. Yeah. I think that condition is is fine. That it's it's limited to the existing structure. There's no further intrusion. And if the board wanted to require that the vegetation uh, be you know maintained for screening, that's also a good yeah. good idea. I think that's a good idea. It's only yeah. along the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, along the road. Further um, solar panels to go in in the setback. Like if they said, oh, we just want another row. and No, no right. further right. intrusion without relief. We would be right, right, approving right. this plan. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, I'll make, if you make that motion, motion, you can make that. No, no, no. No, nobody yet. did. I'll okay. make that motion. OK, so Lisa's made a motion to grant the relief as requested with those conditions of no further intrusion, vegeta vegetative screening maintained. Um, any other conditions? Is that it? No, and I do want to make the point that this does have significant wetlands, so it is. Yeah. it has a lot to do with the shape and topography of the, of the site. Lot. Yeah. Um, so, all right, so uh, Madam Chair, I believe you have that there's language in your packet that you're supposed to use to uh, make that motion. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Thanks. Just in case you didn't know. Wow. Do you know what page that's on, Stephen? <laughs> is it on the, in the, uh, oh, here it is, 423. Oh, under, uh, do the shape of the wall projection. Do you want to just read it? It's a history of it. Is it in the alternative due to the shape of the lot and soil conditions thereon? Applicant six really blah, 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 blah. So I don't, is that it? Do you just read that sentence? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. So I make the motion to approve the relief as requested due to the shape of the lot and soil conditions thereon. Um, uh, relief for the setback provisions of section 189-16A by variance pursuant to zoning bylaw section 139-32 to validate the solar array as it now sits. Um, with the conditions that no further change to the solar array nor structure um, is allowed in that area without further relief from the board and uh, keeping the vegetation along the road for screening.
and say it would be more. And that 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 the that setback intrusion is limited to this yeah. one. Okay. Idea, okay. That. Would someone second that motion, Michael? Okay. So um, the voting will be Jim, Michael, myself, Lisa, and Elisa. So uh, Jim. Aye. Michael. Aye. Myself, I. Aye. 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 Okay. Great. Um, all right, so I'm so sorry. I, I just think thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I am recused myself. I'm recusing myself from the next two. Okay, so, so this is, um, I, I assume we're going to kind of hear them together. Uh, yes. Madam Chair, I would yes. recommend that, or Vice Chair, uh, that you uh, open the public hearings and discuss these together and yeah. then take two votes at the end. That makes sense. Okay, so we're opening application 0423 and 0523, David Stanley Brown, SD <laughs> of Winmore NT. Who is my board, Madam Chair? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Well, is it John? Of, so sure okay yeah john is a regular member so it would be john it would either be jim or mark but maybe jim well we i won't be here next month if it's, if it's continued the okay so let's do jim okay so it's lisa lisa michael john and jim yes okay perfect um i was pretty explicit pretty detailed in my addendum linda williams for the applicant and uh, michael wilson is also here as well as the contract purchaser um Michael's probably the only one who's been on with the ZB as long as I have, because next month I'll be on with the dealing with zoning since 1983, when I went on the ZBA the first time, and then the next 25 years after that. And during that time, primarily in the 80s up through probably the mid to late 90s, we saw a tremendous amount of these because the uh, legal establishment wasn't necessarily aware that when you merge a, you have two side-by-side -side lots, they're undersized, one has a house or not, and you have undeveloped land next to it, they merge for zoning purposes. Even though these are land court properties, they have separate addresses, separate tax bills, separate identities um, all along, and they've known that they were separate lots in the family they were advised that they had mer they did not merge for estate purposes. They were two separate lots and the family has had it for 40 years, over 40 years and thought that they had two separate lots. There is a house on 39, there's nothing on 37. Now I asked Billy, gave him the parameters to go look and told him how to look on the registry site to see some of the old variances that I was involved with. Um, some I wrote and some I was sitting on the board as uh, chairman and vice chair. And I believe he's included maybe six of them, maybe if not more. Six of them, I believe, are in Tom Nevers. This occurred primarily in Tom Nevers because we had a subdivision that dated from back in the 60s where all the lots were less than three acres. In 1972, zoning was enacted, um, changing it to three acres over the top of several hundred uh, one acre and less size lots, which predated zoning. So all of these lots in the Tom Nevers East primarily are less than three acres. The three acre lots were created after zoning, which are on the other side of Chuck Hollow. But on our side of Chuck Hollow, there's common scheme. And I gave you all of the subdivisions uh, in there. And I think maybe less than five lots have not been built on. But in this particular case, this family always thought when they bought the lot separately, it was a 1973 and 1974. So that particular owner, there was no house, there were no houses out there. That particular owner bought the two lots. And then when they transferred, they transferred in a one title. So they kept going in one title, even though they were referred to separately in the, in the title, they were referred to separately as far as the town was concerned, as far as their addresses and tax bills, which have always been separate. So they do have separate identities and the variances that the ZBA has never denied over time, we've seen them and granted variance relief under financial hardship and topography of the lots type of thing to separate them, make them separately marketable and buildable. And that's why we're here now. This is probably one of the last ones you will ever see where there's a vacant lot merged with a house lot. And they were always considered separately. In this case, they're land quartered separately. 
um, because most everybody over time acknowledges that this is the issue. So if a buyer comes in to an attorney, the attorney will take them in separate names. So they don't merge. In this case, they just kept transferring two times after that on the same deed, though they're considered separately. Their um, trust attorney said that they're still separate for you know, state purposes. Now we have a year round couple that wants to buy 37 and the family wants to keep 39. So now we have a problem because technically, regardless of all their identity history that is separate, technically they have merged for solely zoning purposes. No other purpose but zoning purposes. The land court didn't merge them. The tax records don't merge them. The addresses don't merge them. But zoning after 1972, when they've got into the same deed in 74, has merged them. So we're in this conundrum here where it's not common scheme. All those lots on that side of the street are the same size, give or take 100 square feet. The lots, as you see throughout the subdivision, except for the peripheral ones, which came in after 72, are basically within a range of the same size. This, we're just referring to Tom Nevers East. Tom Nevers West was, con, was a little bit different. So that's why we're here is to get them legally marketable and separate ownership. And that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, you can probably use some of the same findings that I had in the previous decisions, which I did a lot of them. Um, John may have come across one when he worked at the ZBA for a while, but Michael's probably the one who's been here the longest that may remember granting these variances with a tremendous amount of them in Tom Nevers because it was all vacant land. So people just all buy two or three lots and back together they go. So that is the premise of our request. And um, because 39 has a house on it, it is also tainted. So that's why you have 37 and 39 in here because the titles are tainted, not even the one with the house on it, which the family wants to maintain. So I will turn it over to Michael Wilson, who's the attorney for one of the lots. He's representing both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to uh, be clear, I'm actually, I represent um, Corey and Rand, who are the contract purchasers. And um, another attorney who is not on the board right now represents the applicants, the ones who are at the, the improved property at 39. I, I think just the most illustrative uh, depiction for the board is what Ms. Williams referred to, and it's it's a good GIS area plan. Shows all of the Flintlock, Longwood, Whitetail, Chuck Hollow neighborhood, Parson, um, and a lot, if not super majority as you have in your packet are all consistently shaped and developed as uh, what's before you, what the applicant is before you. you. Take a look at the other side of the road. Uh, I have a particular interest over there. I live over there, the, the uh, Wild West side where we have a lot of uh, very small lots on the uh, from Gloucester all the way up to Arlington. Um, all of them uh, for, the, for the most part are developed save a few in between. So if you look at the, the nature of the neighborhood, uh, the fact that we have year round employees who want to uh, year round, I'm sorry, residents who have finally gotten an opportunity. And I think you have a letter in there from the contract seller um, represented by the council, which uh, explains their position on it and their, their concern and confusion about where they find themselves now. Will, Will the relief being requested have, a, have any type of negative impact on this neighborhood? And I would submit to you that if you look at how the neighborhood is developed, um, this is septic. So to the extent Title V bears on, on your concerns, the amount of development on this property is controlled by Title V. And I suppose if, um, if these contract sellers wanted to go the covenant route, this could be subdivided under the covenant program similarly. Um, but thankfully my clients don't qualify under the covenant program because they've been working hard and living here for the last uh, decade plus. I came across this property and we'd like to build a year round home here. And I'd ask uh, on that basis and, and to the extent the other information in the packet you need, you need to read it in or, or if you want to stipulate that it's in the record and uh, consider also the contract sellers request to the board as well. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? 
for the applicant. Yep. Is there um, anybody that from the public that'd like to speak? Hi, Barbara Tibbetts, 43 Chacalo. Mike, I don't, I just got this letter, saw that it was near my house, curious as to what's happening. I know 38 has been, is sold. Is this now 38 and 37 that are going to be combined? I'm a little confused. No, 37 so, would. I just want to understand. I don't know. I, I, I thought. 37 and 39. Okay, so you, didn't you, didn't you buy 38? 30, no, 37. 37. Okay, so you bought 30. Someone else is involved in buying 38, correct? No, 38's been sold. That's across the street. 39 is is the house that the, that the family has owned. And you're trying to buy that 37. We're trying to buy the empty lot. Okay, yeah. and put a house on it. Yes. Okay, so I do know where I am. Um, and my, my question is, how big is the house? <laughs> Uh, it, it, and, and the lot, like I just don't, I don't know the, the lot. It looks like the lot's about, um, sorry, we should just do it through the chair rather than talk directly. The lot's about uh, 1.5 acres. And it's like a three or four bedroom house. It would be allowed just like yours. Same yeah. thing. Yeah. I just didn't, when I got the letter, I didn't understand why it was that. It can be confused. Okay. Um, Sarah, did you want to say something? I represent the owners at five person lane and um, they're on the outer source. They're in opposition. To Are this. They, do they back up to this? Is that five? Yeah, they don't touch it. But they're on the abutters list. Source. They're within abutters of abutters within 300 feet. Right. Yeah. So you. Can you just show us on the map which ones yeah, they which are? Ones? I have a little blow up here that shows mm -hmm. Parson and, and the two lots, and I just want to understand which one it is. She said it's not that, right? Oh, it's not that? Well, you said they don't touch it. No, so they're. That one. They're okay. Here. Okay. And they're opposing it? Yeah. Why? I this one here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one on the corner. Okay. Do you guys all see that? The, mm -hmm. okay. This one right here. Butter to an butter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. So these properties have been merged for a very long time. This is exactly what merger is supposed to address. It's supposed to merge lots in order to cure nonconformities. This is specifically why we have a merger, why we have mergers to, to reduce nonconformities. And that's what ha has happened in this particular case. Um, your criteria for finding um, that a variance is appropriate includes a specific finding that owing to circumstances relating to the soil condition, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located. I don't see how in this particular case, you can make a finding that there are soil condition, shape, or topography that affect this land, but doesn't generally affect the zoning district. Um, Mr. Wilson just showed you the overview of the neighborhood and pointed out that there are all sorts of lots that fall into this exact same situation. So the lot is not unique. It's not specifically affected by soil topography. And I just don't think that there's a way for you to, to make the finding necessary to grant the variance in this particular case as much as you might want to. Thank you. Madam Chair, might I add something? Sure. Um, actually, I think Sarah just made our case. If you force the com combining of these lots when they have been considered separate for 50 years now, uh, that would create a situation that is an anomaly. Because when you look at the other four vacant, four or five vacant lots in there, and they, I think, have all houses pending. This would be the only one in the old subdivision that would be combined because uh, though Billy only found six, there are quite a few more that I could have found. Um, he just 
he decided that he was going to try to look for him and it was he did a great job. He had to go through every variance for over a 10 year period to pull out the ones that actually were this particular issue. So this would create a massive financial hardship for this family who is thought for estate purposes and a local attorney worked with an attorney in Florida uh, and assured them that these were separate lots and could be devised out separately as separately marketable and buildable all along when the family was planning on their uh, estate. So multiple times the attorneys uh, obviously thought that these were separate lots, even though they started transferring on the same uh, title for 40 years ago, everybody has considered them separate from the very beginning and the town considers them separate. I just have to point that out again. This is gonna be a massive uh, impact on this family and it would create uh, something that's out of the common scheme of the original subdivision that predated 1972 zoning. It dates back to American Legion, I think in the 60s. So they get separate tax bills. Separate tax bills, separate addresses, separate everything. Mm -hmm. And I did have um, Nikki send you out the comment from the, own, the owner uh, that was sent to me last night. Did you not get this? I have multiple copies. Of yeah, if you sent it by email this morning, I didn't get it. We can just share it. We can share it. That's good. Oh, thank you. Uh, the owner says, good afternoon. The current situation with 37 and 39 Chuck Hollow Road properties is very troubling to our family. My parents trust, these are the next generation down, by the way, if not the third generation. My parents trust attorney, Mary Beth Crawford, she's in Florida, was never notified that the properties had been merged, nor were my parents or myself as a trustee. I've been paying the tax, two tax bills himself since 1998 when my father passed away. I've included copies of the most recent submission, my parents, which I had in my packet. My parents trust attorney worked directly with attorney, I hesitate to read his name, but a local attorney um, who is retired to ensure that two properties remained as separate pots. My parents' desire all along was to be able to distribute their assets the way that they wanted upon their death to their three children. Very pleased to have met um, Rand and Corey Smith, the prospective purchasers, yeah. knowing that they were Islanders and had been renting since they had come to the island. The thought of them being able to achieve their goal of homeownership on Nantucket was very meaningful to all of us. My parents would honestly be cheering mission from heaven. I sincerely hope and trust that the board will rule favorably on this request for a variance so that the two families can start their dreams of living on Nantucket. Additional notes, my family and descendants have been coming to Nantucket since the late 1870s. Both of my parents were heavily involved in a number of great causes on island. Father was specifically singled out to assist with the injured from the plane crash, so was my father, in 1958, the Northeast Convair flight. The state police picked my father up at a dinner party, and that's who my father was, and took him out there. Michael, I hope this is useful in your effort tomorrow afternoon. Now, I understand that the variance criteria is soil shape and topography as it was when I did all the original decisions in the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, actually. Um, but we had to be reasonable and we had to look at the great financial harm and whether or not it was going to be uh, detrimental to the neighborhood. And making these two separate lots is certainly not detrimental since most of the lots in the pre-72 subdivision are this size and certainly less than three acres. As I said before, the three acre zones, um, three acre parcels that are surrounding this and at the very end of the ABC lots on the Tom Nevers West were created after it was changed to LUG3, which sort of didn't exist back in the 60s. And we are left with a, an anomaly in that subdivision. So it is the only one probably left that is in this particular situation since the other vacant lots seem to be in held in separate ownership. So this would be um, a problem for this particular uh, issue with these two lots. So we're asking you to go ahead and use some of the, the uh, findings that the previous ZBAs made in those other decisions to justify the granting of this. But it's not and, 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 it's or, or, or in the uh, variance criteria under that particular statute. And financial hardship can be considered 
when dealing with these, because I believe I put that in the previous decisions. So if you have any other questions about this, Lisa. Uh, well, just the only question was, I don't see any of those decisions in the packet. I thought Billy had them. It's in the staff, staff report. report. Oh, staff report. Oh. What pages? I think I have. You that. have the staff report? I do. Okay. But I think I thought it was part of 23 Orange Street. So no, maybe it's way in the back. I did see a bunch of decisions. Yeah, it's further there. down. It's at the very end of your packet, more than likely, because they're the last two cases in the packet. But we were pretty consistent because this was happening a lot in Tom Nevers, as I said, because there were no, no houses in Tom Nevers in the 80s until you started getting built on. And then people realized that we had, I built on this one, and now I, all of a sudden I got a problem on the other one. And that's why they are, a lot of these were done in Tom Nevers. Because it was a uh, Wild West in Tom Nevers, as Michael knows back in those days. Oh, here we go. I, I, I just found them. Sorry about that. So if you go to the it's the very end, it's go to the last two paragraphs. The finding paragraph is the one before the granting paragraph, but they're on the last pages. Yeah. I could probably go out there and go to every one of those lots. But the findings are pretty consistent among those particular six. Lisa, I have a question for Leslie. Sure, of course. Go ahead, Mark. Um, uh, Michael. Leslie, this is pre existing non conforming because of the advent of zoning? I'm actually not sure if they're pre existing non conforming because they were created prior to zoning or if they were created when the zoning was different in Tom Nevers. Because um, Tom Nevers hasn't always been an LUG3. Okay. LUG3 didn't exist in um, 78, I but it was it was the zoning was changed either it's it was done in 1972 or at some time it it was up zone. Yeah, they were valid pre-existing non-conforming okay. lots, so but they've merged. Assuming they've merged, uh, or they haven't merged. Is there any change, any difference in the amount of ground cover that could be on these two lots? No, the, the ground cover would be the same. Yeah. Um, number of, of uh, bedrooms would probably be about the same, mm -hmm. depending on sept septic size. Yeah, because the, the Board of Health regulations are based on lot size. Okay, so and if, yeah, assuming it was done uh, at the advent of zoning, if this couple who own them, bought them or own them, had put one in a trust and one in their own name, they wouldn't be here today, would That's they? That's right. They would not be here today. That's okay. correct. Okay. Because so. they kept them in the same name and they transferred on the same title, even though they had separate identities uh, from 1974 forward, it's mm -hmm. under the do merger doctrine that Sarah mentioned, they one doesn't have a house, one does have a house. Had they both had houses on them, it's questionable whether they have merged at all. Right. But because we have a vacant same size lot next to the house lot and they're still held in the same name, that's where the problem occurred, even though the land count, you know, uh, land court considers them completely separate lots and the town has considered them separate lots all along. Because I went through this with uh, Rob down at the assessor's office and all the way back to 74, they've been considered separate lots by the but, town. But two lots, could have been checkerboarded mm -hmm. yes. back in 72 and they wouldn't be here today. Right. Well, except sort. for a period of time that a judge ruled that, that the wife was under the uh, power of the husband. Yeah, it's not to Stephanie. And, and that, yeah, the control. Yeah, and that not lasted control. for how long, Sarah? <laughs> a year? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> What point am I trying to make? Uh, if if these people had a, a good lawyer at the time, they wouldn't wouldn't be here today. Um, they would so, have taken and, them and in I separate. I have ownership. sat on several of these that were granted. I just I do want to just a clarification question. The Allowable ground coverage on the lots that's separated would be 2,000 square feet per lot? Yes. 
And by zoning on three acres, it'd be 3,600. So there would be a difference. I'm just clarifying that for the record because there, it's not identical. 400 feet? 400 foot difference, yeah. So, uh, we, just so you know, one of those, I don't know if you found that one in your grouping of six there, but one of the ones we did back in probably the late 90s was they, uh, they were inherited and they were inherited for all of a half an hour at the registry into the same ownership and they couldn't get them apart. I believe that was in Tom they, Nevers. They, they all seem to be from the 80s that we have, yeah. 86 and 87. We started back in the mid 80s when this became an issue, when they started building right. on properties. That's when they figured out, oh my God, I took them in the same name. Well, I'm just saying we don't have any, any decisions past 87. Yeah, there were several in 90s, but he looked for a period of about 10 years right. and then I, I wanna, figured you had enough. If, if, if uh, the board didn't agree to this, you wouldn't see the decision necessarily because they would have withdrawn it right so no it would have been a denial just, they never denied them so well it would have been probably withdrawn right not yeah denied. So but they never denied one this is a proof 100 percent that it's been done i mean as sarah stated it's we like to fix problems not continue this will fix the problem by merging I know it's a difficult issue. Although to be fair, even if these two lots, well, no, never mind, never mind, never mind. It's, it's just, it's just, it's just lot area because I think they've they've plenty of front to justice. We're still stuck with with septic on each lot. We're still stuck with uh, one bedroom for ten thousand square feet. We're still stuck with where is everybody else as well in septic. We're still stuck with the same ground cover, only it's on two separate lots instead of one big well, lot. 36 now yeah 4, so 000. we're you know we're still in the same place that every other lot on the street in the subdivision is and uh not that we can control this but this is it's not being purchased to build a spec house or a rental would it make any difference no. if we took it from 2,000 square feet to 1,800 square feet well if that I, would I, I no. appease i think that that is a, a reasonable uh, so that way, the ground coverage isn't changing by the separation. Uh, we need to is. know uh, how many square feet the the, the owner has right now. Oh, we can look at that. Yeah. And well, they're not asking to do anything with the thirty nine. That's just the, the house the family's going to keep, and I don't. Right. You know, that's them. The lot at thirty seven is still under the same two thousand square foot restriction total, as well as the one bedroom for. 10,000 square feet. So they're only allowed like four bedrooms, five bedrooms with an IA system. So they're not allowed any more than they're normally allowed anywhere anyway. They'd allow eight bedrooms if they were combined. That's Give or take the IA system uh -huh. allowance. Uh -huh. First floor area. 12, yeah, 1256. Yeah. Okay. 1256. So. And that's the only structure on that lot, right? They don't yeah. have a garage or anything. But we don't want to tell the guys. But I, I, Linda, I, I think the, the owner of both properties is a beneficiary of a decision that's in positive for Michael's client and your client. Well, because his title is tainted, though he does have a house on it, because it was arguably merged with the vacant lot. So when we did these previous decisions, we affected both lots. So they were both clear and separately marketable and buildable, no matter what they want to do on them. Well, um, let me put it in another way. If, if the board is willing to approve this without a, a 3,600 foot square footage limit on both properties, and you know, which may mean 1,800 feet a, a lot, it seems like that's, that's something. And I, I personally uh, don't need to, to make that condition, but if, if that's what the board wants to do, if you're heading towards voting for it, I'll support it. Are we talking 1800 feet on the ground, correct? Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah, well, that, that would be, I know, I'd hate to say it, but it would be unfair considering how much 
everybody else gets the 2000 and then we put specifically put it in four lots it came up in tom nevers it specifically was put in because of the issues in tom nevers along with the 10 foot setback as opposed to a 20 foot setback because tom nevers as i said before 1972 was the wild wild west but everybody out there is entitled to 2000 on their own one acre lots and the 10 foot setback because they're in an lug3 zone so it's an anomaly with tom nevers the Kevin Dale doctrine came out of Tom Nevers, too. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of stuff that went on in Tom Nevers. So over the last 40 years of zoning, we've been sort of trying to get Tom Nevers some relief out there. Right. Did you have another comment? No, I don't. I was just seeing it. Other right. People. I mean, I, I do think that um, the zoning there did change. It used to be 1,500 square yeah. feet. And then for whatever reason, a couple of years ago, it got increased to 2,000. Yeah. Which... You know, isn't necessarily a good thing, but um, you know, there's more density. Instead of having two building or two dwellings, you'll have four dwellings potentially. Well, not when the only less restricted on the forty thousand square foot lot, you're only restricted to four bedrooms. So if you're going to have one of be garage, one bedroom, and a which house, one's going to be forty thousand square feet? Both of them are forty thousand square feet. I thought they were one point five acres. Yeah. yeah, that's what the tax thing says. That's sixty thousand square feet. That's six, so that's bedrooms. six bedrooms. Yeah. If take. you want to reduce it to four bedrooms, I'm perfectly happy to make that part of my motion. No, we're just asking for the same thing everybody else has. And I don't yeah. want to impact the family that's keeping their property either. Oh, yes. Yeah, I know. It's a common comment. scheme. Oh, sorry. I just would like to clarify a few statements that have been made for the, for the record. The, the Dale Doctrine didn't come out of Tom Nevers. The Dale Doctrine came out of the Woody Tash fabricatory situation. Yeah, I remember that one on, on North Liberty Street. That's where that came from. Not that it matters, but it didn't come from Tom Nevers. These lots are not restricted to one bedroom per 10,000 square feet because they could have IA systems and get bonus bedrooms. I hey, don't bedroom. know what that would be, but it would be at least two, right, if not good to eight. Yeah. Right, probably get you to eight, maybe nine bedrooms. Um, they could have three dwellings per lot. Oh, a, a tertiary. With the tertiary, as opposed to a total of three. Um, the ground cover you've already pointed out, it, they, do, they do gain ground cover when they have the two separate lots. So I think if you're, if you're going to bend over backwards to grant this relief, despite what the what the bylaw says and what the clear state law is on the subject, you should think about some restrictions, either mm -hmm. bedrooms, dwellings, ground cover, all of that um, to make it so that there isn't such an impact on the neighborhood. Did you have another comment? Yeah, could you just restate your name? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, I'm Barbara Tibbetts. I live okay, at 42 Chuck Hollow. And the owners that she's representing at Five Parson live behind me. Mm -hmm. I do not know them. I met them briefly just like a month ago in or November. <laughs> Their house is giant. I don't See know that. how many bedrooms. I know there's a giant pool. There's a giant tennis court. And it was built behind me. And I didn't even really know what was happening because I, I wasn't living here full time, which I am now. Um, so I'm not sure why she's arguing about how big the properties are on in Tom Nevers, because this is this is someone I've known actually for many many years. He worked out, helped do some work on my house, like when I first bought it, and um, now my son actually plays hockey with him. So you know this is small island, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's wants to own on this island and be a part of it, and I think that's a really important thing that we need to pay attention to right now, based on all the things that are happening to this island. I moved here because I love this small community um or full time and i think that we need to to listen to the people that actually really want to work and live here and i can tell you that they do that this the, but the people behind me they come in, they, they're not there that much they're there in the summer i think they were here for thanksgiving i can see right into their their you know i can see everything and they have a giant tennis court which i don't really hear Fortunately, because we have a lot of scrub oak, you know, we have, and I think their property, same thing. There's going to be a lot of space between each of the homes. So I'm not sure why the people behind me are upset, except for the people built that built next to me blocked their view. And when you buy up high and, and there aren't a whole lot of us up high, you do want a view. I, I get it. I mean, I worry about what could happen in front of me too, but 
these are like people that want to work hard and be here on Nantucket. And this doesn't make it, it's not, it's not make, it's not computing to me. I know it's because of zoning, but if we're really, I mean, look at all the other stuff that's happened on this island that is detrimental. This is one guy trying to just build a home. I understand. I, I understand. All right. Can I point out one more thing? It, usually I do it conversely to how much ground cover you're allowed, but 2,000 square feet on an acre and a half, uh, acre and a half gives you 58,000 square feet of open space. So how much impact is 2,000 square feet, let's relative, 2,000 square feet is going to have on his lot? Because no matter what he does, he's still stuck with 2,000 square feet. Like everybody else in out of the 200 lots or however many lots are in there, he's still stuck at 2,000 square feet. Now, I know from an HDC perspective, I've seen people come back to get that extra 500 square feet on a garage apartment or, you know, some other thing, a studio or something else or an office. So, I mean, everybody is beginning to take advantage of that 2,000 square foot that's on a minimum of an acre to two acres in an LUG3, since there are so many lots in there in the same situation that these two lots are in. So 2,000 square feet with 90% of it is an open space. You can't, other than a pool, let's say, or a tennis court as uh, five Parsons is not gonna have an impact on that neighborhood when every one of the lots on that side of the street is identical to these two. And a lot of them have all been built on with varying degrees of pools or no pools and garages, et cetera. So I think a 2,000 square feet out of 60,000 square feet is not that big a deal for them to be able to have some flexibility. So we're just asking for fairness and a financial impact, et cetera, et cetera. And the findings are all in there. It's easy to suck them out, put them in this one. So that's all we're asking for. Okay. Uh, anybody have any other comments? Motion? I, just, I do want to point out that it really isn't about who, it's not about who's buying the property. We know. Frankly, it should have nothing to do with these people. It's really about. We know. It's just yeah. anecdotal. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was just pointing that out for the, oh, she's our, oh, she's there. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate the support. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand it. And I know Rand too. And they're and I don't know, Corey, but I'm, uh, I, she, I, she looks familiar. You know, they're lovely people. It's great to have them in the neighborhood, but it's really not about who's buying the property. It's about the, it's not, it's just about equities and the equities was a, was a, an argument that was brought up on every single one of those during the uh, public hearing process. So if this was not granted, they would then, uh, if, the entire property was one lot, they would be allowed 3,600 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to make a motion to approve, but to limit the newly subdivided lot to 1,800 square feet per lot. Even the one that the family's keeping? Yes. I don't know what the, how that impacts I, the existing would house. Would you be willing to, to uh, leave them alone? Include that. <clears throat> you you only since since one family owns it right now uh -huh. uh, that they've got thirty six hundred feet and they can divide it up any way they want. So they, they, two, keep they can't go two. over two thousand on one lot, obviously, but it'd be two thousand and and uh, sixteen hundred on the other one. Can I? Add, I just have something else for discussion. I have less concerned about ground covers than I do uh, six potential dwelling units on these two lots. Well, you can limit it to I two I would each. rather limit yeah, that than each. ground coverage. Okay. You can and, limit it to two and dwelling units, I'm going to continue. Pools, uh, you know, all, all that stuff that creates density in these neighborhoods is what I have concern about is having two separate lots there. I mean, well, they could have two pools on the combined lot which is ridiculous it is frankly it twice so i'm just crazy. i know it's, it's absurd it's it should crazy. not be allowed and they don't count for ground cover and they're i know grade. which is absurd so i'm you know i'm just telling you my point of view mm -hmm. is i'm really concerned about things like that and and it's not included in our zoning bylaw and doesn't address those issues so that's why i have the biggest issue about these these well, properties. everybody else is allowed a pool, but they're not ground cover. But Rand just said, if you want to limit 37, we don't want to do anything to 39 because they're keeping that. That's the family. They didn't do anything wrong. But what Rand has suggested making... is that one dwelling unit on his property and one pool, and that's it, on his property. 
leave 39 alone because they have a, we don't know what their plans are, are over you, there are and I don't want to negatively to, impact them. Are they willing to? This is the lot that's got the problem. Have pretty much one structure on that property and a pool. One well, I wouldn't do structure. Unit. One dwelling, one dwelling one unit dwelling. and a pool. And it's not just rent; it's rent inquiry, and they would agree to yep. one dwelling, no secondary, no tertiary. I checked with the attorney for for the developed property. I I don't have the authority to find no the developed property to the restriction. Sorry. And they were sort of innocent bystanders here. They've got legal representation all the way through that these were fine. So because Rand is the one that's taking it and the conditions in the 37 decision run with the land, one dwelling unit and one pool, and they're still capped at 2,000 square feet or 1,800 square feet or whatever you want to do. But it, I, my, it, I, I would, I think the sellers should be restricted in some way. I mean, they're, they're gaining this benefit. Well, they, they thought they had it all and, along. Can, if these merge, they can do whatever they want with their property. They can be okay. Significantly what they're doing now. Yeah. Right. Right. So they're but not, I think the point is that they're going to make a profit from yeah. subdividing it, that they should. Well, they thought they had that all along for estate purposes. Right. And I hate to say wrong. Foley Vaughn, but Foley Vaughn is the one that worked with the guy in Florida and said, these are two separate lots for right. estate purposes. They're always going to be separate lots. And for estate purposes, you can always sell one out so your family can keep the other one. Right. We understand so it's around the issue. third generation of this family. Yeah, right. But I don't want to Im negatively impact 39 because they have rights over there. But if Rand, who's getting 37 and it runs with if Rand sells it, it runs with the next owner, it runs with the land. If they have one dwelling unit and one pool and they're capped at 1800 square feet, that's it. 2000. That's it for them. They're not going to a secondary dwelling. They're not going to a tertiary dwelling. But I don't want to do something to 39 who thought that they were doing everything right all along. It's the vacant lot that has caused the problem, not the house lot, just 37. But because there's a taint on the title, 39 had to be included in this application. John, how do you feel? You've been very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> just taking it all in yeah um i think right wrong or otherwise the two are these two are connected I mean, yeah uh, I, again I, I i appreciate that we don't may not want to punish 39 in any way but at, by the same token there's but they are. The, two, the two the two are connected um i'm inclined to grant this with a reasonable restriction of some sort and what what how we and it can either be just on 37 or it can be on 39 we have in here that 39 has already a ground cover ground cover of 1607 mm -hmm. so uh, i'm did you see that i thought it was 12 something 12 six. i i'm i'm pulling that from the staff memo oh okay so so it's not that much more expandable <coughs> anyway yes yeah. exactly. to my point i don't really care about the ground coverage and if, and if, and if i think it's I think in light of all the circumstances, I think it's okay to put some sort of restriction on it, whether it be ground cover, whether it be number of structures, or if you're saying- Dwellings. Dwellings, that, that, sorry, thank you. Or number of dwellings or what, whatever it may be. I think that's I think that's reasonable in what we're going to do. And we do have a history of granting these. Um, so that's, again, I'm inclined to vote in favor of this, but I think a restriction is, appropriate and just is what type of reasonable restriction we want to put on and if we if we can live with just just doing one on uh 37 great if we think that 39 needs to have some sort of encumbrance as well then well, how about 39 with one with two dwelling units and capped to 2000 so they can't have a tertiary they don't have much room left anyway but they may have an expanding family since they're getting rid of this one they may need more space over here but if rand's willing to do one dwelling unit in a pool no tennis court, we're done with his lot, <laughs> pretty much. And if you don't really care yeah. about the ground cover, so, then we've got um, room. I'm sure you would word it much better than I would, John. Don't be so John, sure. You, you no, 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 I would. <laughs> would. Jim or Jim or so to, um, you can clean up what I, maybe what I'm about to say, but I'd like to make a motion to approve and um, with the condition of 37, um, only allowed to have 1,800 square feet and one dwelling and a pool and um, 
with 39 being allowed the 2,000 square feet with a limit of two dwellings. Oh, I was gonna. Madam Chair, you can't see. Sorry. I, I just wanna, can I ask the applicant a question? Yeah. Because they've been saying that the one property is going to be retained by the family, but their listings for 37 and 39 Chuck Hollow Road. So, oh, really? We're not aware of that because we don't <laughs> represent that. So, I mean, if the family <laughs> needs to sell them, they need Wait to sell them. Wait a minute. But it has nothing to do with anything in here because we understood that the family was retaining it. So, I'm not, I'm not making any other representations other than that. Right. And it's not really relevant. Le Leslie? Would we have to make two separate motions on this, given yeah. that it's two two it's, applications? It's two, yeah. applications. two applications, okay. two decisions, mm -hmm. two motions. Okay. Thirty-nine you would agree not to have a tertiary if that was part of um, yeah. restricting thirty-nine. That's okay, check. Thank you. Not tertiary. Well, then would you put the would you put the same restrictions on yes, both lots? Yeah, yeah. So eighteen hundred square feet, eighteen hundred each a pool. No tertiaries. He's Rand is asking for the 2000 on 37 since he can't have a secondary and he can't have a tertiary. He's just asking for a reasonable 2000, which is what everybody else. On you can the still have a 200 square foot shed. That's not a dwelling. No, he's asking. My, 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 no, you, you have to get to the microphone and, and uh, state your name. Hi, Rand Smith. Um, they're all in a row there. They're all 1.5 acre lots, except you would put. You, this one would be a, uh, a a three acre lot, and somebody can build a McMansion with with pool and guest house and additional buildings. So if this is left at a three, it's going to look different than all of the other homes that are in a row there. There are like six of them in a row that are one point five. I got it, but I'm trying to say there's no equity in it then. That they're all they're all kind of they're all kind of cookie cutter one and a half, so they're all allowed to have two thousand except for these two in the middle. Well, I'm just going to point out that the existing property that you're saying is going to look different only has a ground coverage of sixteen hundred and something square feet at the moment. At the moment, right? right. So right. which is maybe we freeze it at that, and then you won't look so odd. I, don't, I mean, I'm just, I'm, no, I'm playing devil's fair. advocate about, yeah, yeah. you know, that's the, the whole yeah. thing, you know. So. so right now we're standing with John's motion, which is two dwelling units, 2,000 uh, No, it was on Elisa's, 39. Elisa's motion. Yeah, on, Lisa, but then, uh, okay, go ahead. On 39, and then a pool and 1,800 on 37. And again, I'm asking for the 2,000 since he can't put a secondary and he can't put a tertiary. And a lot of them in there have garage apartments or secondary dwellings particularly on Tom Nevers West on smaller lots. So why don't we deal with these maybe one at a time? On, um, yeah, 39 first. Should we then? do 39 first? Because that might be the... So so, thir so 39 is the uh, is the one that is improved with single family dwelling. Yeah, that's right. And just through uh, <coughs> to clarify what the board was saying, that it is... And it, and it is for sale. I just want to be okay. I'm not aware positive. of that, so I'm not making that representation one way or the it's, other. There is a listing for it for sale, just to be. Two, okay, really we're saying clear. we're saying two dwelling units in 1800. No, that was no. 2000. No, we're, well, we haven't made the motion. Yeah. Well, that was Elisa's motion. It was that 2000 was with, with two okay, dwelling we're units. Gonna, period. We're, se Lino, we're separating this, and we're starting right. with 39. Let's so 39. We were we were going to say that's two dwelling units and. 2,000 square foot, and yeah. this is this is the one that's already improved with 1607. It's 1606, 1607. Is that, is that what you want? I don't think we had any determination of what the other one. I, 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 I don't restrict that ground coverage. Too. Yeah, I would I would just keep it at. I would make the restrictions the same on both lots, both 18. 1800 single yeah. dwellings with pools. Yep. That's not fair. Let let us work it out. It's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> they're getting, a, they're getting a, a buildable lot out yeah. of something that's not buildable. And how much are they on the market for? Let's just say it. That's, I can't even go there. Well, I'm <laughs> curious. So let's just reel it in here. Based only on Google. Yep. Um, I see two listings that were put on in December for just under 2.5 for 39. 
Okay. And then for 37. Uh, 1.5, just under 1.5. Okay. So they're marketing them without this approval, but go ahead. Now I'm getting irritated. Well, they, they were- They were marketing they two them separate based bills, on... Two separate tax yeah. bills. And they, they but, but they have merged. Whether they didn't think they'd merged or not, yeah. they have merged. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I don't think there's any anything unusual about coming to the zoning board if you're trying to get out of a piece of real estate. Yeah. So it doesn't have but any bearing. We need to on be any. able to form our our conditions. Yeah, I mean it's not like you know they're trying to you know sometimes we hear that we're trying to pass Nantucket on to our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, you which can't... we did here yeah. in the letter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I mean, that's not our business. Ultimately. Yeah. So, anyway, go ahead. John, do you mind taking over the motion? Uh, but, uh, just one of the questions. So, you you would prefer 2,000 square feet on the new, on I, the lot? I would. I would just respectfully tell you that I represent the contract purchasers, not the contract sellers, and I'm not in a position to be able to bind 39. And I'd ask you to consider not binding 39. With respect to 37 and the overall arching goal of zoning to keep this neighborhood without any negative impact on it, my clients want you to restrict no secondary dwelling, no tertiary dwelling, and just allow them the default ground cover ratio on both lots, which is going to be restricted by setback, septic, and the restrictions of no secondary or tertiary I, on 37. So maybe we just restrict them both to 2,000 square feet, only yeah. primary dwelling and a pool. Yeah, I'd be okay. I, I, and, a, and a garage, only one dwelling unit. Yeah. I will just ask you not restrict 39. I don't have the authority to say yes to 39. Well, we can also just make a decision on 37. Yeah. And, and not and, and follow 39 another time and continue that one. Uh, that, would be really, yeah. that would could be that really would be really bad. Yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> well, we're trying. Well, I, I defer to the that mean just because uh, well, we're it's, it's, mean it's, it's, it's more like what That's true. Does, they don't have to do does, does everyone think that they, they shouldn't be an extra 400 feet of ground cover again that i'm less worried about the density okay. with, the, with dwelling units lisa <laughs> if if there were i'm with lisa i'm i that's another way to skin the cat, I guess, as you say, just to limit it to one dwelling. So if it were, if they were both limited to one dwelling, I would agree to the two thousand square feet. And it's so, so and, um, tertiary. and no tertiary. Michael uh, said but, uh, that yes, he's not, cool. he's not, uh, he can't make that decision for for thirty, so thirty nine, nine. thirty nine. Uh, so the, you know, the, the alternative here is to do something else or put this off until the seller is can decide what they right. want to do because the seller is the one benefiting the buyer of yeah. the lot is benefiting because they're getting a lot, maybe. Right. <laughs> Just a, a point of order. I think there's a motion on the floor. Yeah. But you all have sort of veered away from that. Yeah. Did it? And can can we can withdraw I, that motion? She can withdraw it, but can I just? I'll withdraw the motion just for conversation's sake. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to just point out that you guys can, hmm. you know, make whatever decision that you want to make. They don't have to agree to it. Right. Right. That's so always, that's yeah. one thing. Um, two, you could continue because we were supposed to end the meeting at three thirty because there's another meeting following. Um, I forgot my third point. I had three, but. <laughs> I'll just It'll come back. Oh, that was turned. The third was turn it down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or you could deny it. Well, I have a well, feeling I, the buyers I can convince the sellers to. Oh. But would you be inclined to approve, um, Madam Chair, so that I can go to the sellers council who had. I just did. Oh, no. Her council. Okay. 
just told me that they will agree to one dwelling unit and a pool on 39, one dwelling unit and a pool on 37, and 2,000 square feet. So they'll give up Fine. everything over there. Okay. Okay. So the okay. motion is back in action. A motion to approve with 37 and 39 to have the same conditions. They, really, they have to be two separate. Yeah, two separate motions. 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 Okay. So right? 39. Okay. okay. We'll do that. To have 37 uh, to approve and to have 37 and 39 be restricted restricted to one dwelling each at 2,000 square feet per dwelling, no tertiary dwelling. No, 2,000 square feet of ground cover. Yeah, oh, per, lot. Yep. per lot. Per yeah. lot. That's, that's and a I, pool. Yes. And on each, one. each to have a pool, no tertiary buildings. And no secondary. And obviously no, no, no secondary, secondary by tertiary. saying only one dwelling. Okay. okay. Just, and just to clarify, so you're 2,000 square feet of ground cover, one dwelling unit each, and one pool each. Yeah. each. Yeah. And no tertiary. Secondary and yeah, yeah. Well, not a dwelling is a yeah. Yes. Sure, Sarah. Go ahead. So when you're saying one dwelling unit, one pool, does that mean no shed, no tennis court? No, no, no. no. They could have a garage, and they could have a garage a studio. studio. So why are you saying one pool I, per I don't know. lot? Per lot. Okay, so they can't have two pools per lot. Yes, like some people have done. Okay. Yeah, let's just say one pool per lot. And yeah, if the pools end up counting as ground coverage at some point, they'll have to come back and get a variance for their pool. Well, they'll be grandfathered at that point if they already so anyway, have. No, oh, I don't think they should be. So you're not you're not restricting any other construction other than the ground yes. cover to two thousand. Yeah. And no other so dwelling on no either lot. lot. No, no secondary second dwelling. No other right. dwelling. No tertiary. Okay. One and dwelling no unit. Well, I just I just want to clarify. I am not grandfathering the pool, and if something no, happens, I'm with saying the that's just the operation of zoning. Most of the time, when you have something that exists and then the zoning changes, then it's grandfathered. Then it's back in here under thirty three A. So yeah, well, I guess. Okay, so should we take that's the uh, motion John? for both lots? Oh, Jim, Jim. sorry, Jim. Jim. Oh, so we have uh, a friendly amendment. I'm, just, I'm a little uncomfortable still uh, binding 37 without, I mean, kind of hearing phone calls coming in. Well, there, I just spoke I to know that. the attorneys kind of here, but well, it's going to go into it's going to be a condition, be and if they don't go it. along with it, then none of it, not, it's all void. They just did go it along is, with it. She was on the phone I'm to not the sure owners. It's void. She it's, was on the phone we to the owner. Their property. Yeah, yeah, the, the owner is uh, fine. I, I just yeah. want to amend that motion. There's some language that I like. I mean, I'll read it for you in one of the decisions, which says, uh, we caution that the decision reached in this case is reached upon the facts set forth in herein, particularly the good faith nature of the applicant's status and that we might well reach a different decision upon the facts presented by another case, even if the history of the subdivision and conveyance were similar to that now before us. I, I would like to amend and add that language because uh, things have changed since then and every, every fact situation is different. I mean- uh, Every uh, application is different. Right, and this kind of, especially with regard to this area this subdivision mm -hmm. okay do you have you have that down i can i can i can give you the okay so then so we have the motions on the floor do we want to take uh 37 yeah first which is uh, is it second oh you know i'll second i'll second that well we're gonna do oh, it sorry oh okay well we still have to vote so we on can say separately. It together yeah so the yeah. first one is 0423 30, 37 Chuck Hollow Road voting on that I motion. Think, and I'll, I'll, I'll second that motion and okay. saying that due to the unique hardship and the circumstances that a variance is appropriate. Okay, so all those in favor, starting with Jim? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank and then, you for that one. <laughs> and then file number 0523 39 Chuck Hollow Road. Same. Same thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jim. Aye. 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 Do we do we get written confirmation from the thirty nine party rather than just Linda telling us? No. which I believe you. Susan was on the phone with the owner in Florida. They okay. are aware and they All agreed right. to it. They're watching. Okay. Aye. 
Okay. So that motion carries. Thank you very much, guys. And we made it by 3 30. Yeah, we Not quite. Oh. <laughs> Go to the planning board meeting. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Yes. Yeah. So move. Second. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the 19th.